Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Esquivel. I'm chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is February, uh, Tuesday, February 15th. It is 9 a.m. and I would like to call this meeting to order. I'll begin by introducing my fellow board colleagues. With me here today is Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, board member Sean McGuire, board member Nicole uh, Morgan, and board member Laurel Firestone. With us as well is our chief, uh, our executive director, rather, uh, Eileen Sobek, our chief uh, uh, counsel here, Michael Lawfer, our two chief deputies, um, Eric Oppenheimer and Jonathan Bishop, and our clerk, clerk of the board is Janine Townsend, and assisting her is Margie Argel and Courtney Tyler. As you can see, this meeting is being webcast and recorded. Uh, you're either viewing us one of two ways. You're either here on the Zoom platform, in which case you're looking to comment on one of the items here on today's board agenda, or you're viewing us through our customary webcast on YouTube Live and uh, our website. Uh, if you intend on commenting on any item, you need to be here on the Zoom platform. In order to do so, there is a link at the top of our agenda where you can fill out your speaker card and receive um, a link and password here uh, to the Zoom platform. If you have any challenges with that, please do email our clerk of the board, Janine Townsend, at commentletters at waterboards.ca.gov, and she can help get you here onto the platform. Once here, your cameras will be off, you will be on mute until it is your turn to speak on the agenda item you've indicated you wish to do so. Uh, with that, I think we can move on to our uh, actual agenda here. And before uh, we get to our usual public forum, this morning, we actually have a presentation of a Superior uh, Accomplishment Awards, and would like to call up Eric Ekdahl, our head of the Division of Water Rights, uh, to present uh, today's awards. Hi, thank, thank you, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to present a series of Sustained Superior Accomplishment Awards for the development of emergency drought regulations for the Scott and Shasta Rivers. As we've done for the previous few drought related uh, awards, I'll give a high level overview and then introduce the recipients as a, a list. Uh, for a, a quick description, drought conditions have long been a challenge on the Scott and Shasta rivers. The watersheds are tributaries to the Klamath and are the locations of both ecological, cultural and economically significant populations of coho and Chinook salmon. Last winter, as drought conditions deepened, Staff began working in earnest with local, state, and federal partners to better prepare for drought conditions and to plan for what could uh, be needed if drought conditions continue to worsen through the summer. Around June of last spring, the California Department of Fish and Wild submitted, Wildlife submitted a emergency drought flow recommendation for the Scott and Shasta Rivers. The awards we're presenting today are for the work that was done to respond to those recommendations to develop minimum drought flows for the watersheds to protect salmon species. Staff from across divisions and regions contributed to this effort with significant contributions from the Region 1 North Coast Regional Board, Office of Chief Counsel, the Enforcement Section within the Division, and the Board's Division of Information Technology. The Division received CDFW's recommendations in June, and between June and August, there's just a period of about two months, the team set up multiple stakeholder workshops to review the recommendations and discuss potential options. They released an early draft for stakeholders to review less than a month after receipt of the proposed flow recommendations from CDFW, which is an amazingly fast turnaround time. Uh, they conducted a workshop on the draft recommendations, responded to stakeholder comments, had numerous one-on-one -on -one meetings with individual stakeholders, conducted numerous internal briefings, and ultimately brought the emergency flow regulations to the board for their consideration which the board adopted on August 17th. The team then took the adopted regulations through the Office of Administrative Law Process and began the formal curtailment process to go along with these in-stream flow recommendations in early September. The results were very much a team effort, not just this team, but the coalition of local water users, some of whom in entered into water purchase agreements with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, tribes, state agencies, primarily the Department of Fish and Wildlife, but also at the federal level, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service. And to be clear, curtailments are never a popular approach. There's a lot of contentiousness around these issues and a lot of uh, stakeholder communication that needs to occur. Uh, there's a lot of impact to a local economy and the local water users whenever a curtailment is implemented. And staff are often tasked with the very difficult job of trying to navigate 
you know, these local economic challenges, local water use challenges, but also protecting endangered species from the risk of extinction. And this is a task that the uh, team with the board's guidance did remarkably well. Much work remains. While well, flows are above in-stream flow thresholds right now in both of these watersheds, uh, there's significant challenges. We've just had the driest January, February for California's recorded history. And that's going to present increasing challenges throughout the spring and throughout the summer. Uh, the regulations that the team has developed will set a framework for future collaboration, but also for protection of these endangered and endemic species. And so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the team and present these awards today as I call people out. Uh, if you can turn on your camera and at least wave and say hi, uh, it's not quite the same as doing it in person, but this will have to do. First, uh, Branch Chief Aaron Ragazzi, I believe Aaron's out today and is unable to join directly. Uh, Dan Worth, who's the unit chief for the Water Action Plan unit. Uh, Amri Ori, who's the uh, section chief. Uh, Raja Hassan, who has just been promoted to the unit chief for our FERC unit, congratulations. Alex Sweat from the enforcement section. Adam Weinberg, Kevin Delano, Bob Selecki, Mina Chong. From the Division of Information Technology, we have Susan Kelly, who helped us with an immense set of web updates and just kind of was super fast to respond and made numerous changes for us without which we couldn't be doing the kind of rapid real-time response that we're doing today. So a huge thanks to DIT and Susan. From the Office of Chief Counsel, Mariana Awi and Samantha Olson. And then from Region 1, Eli Scott. Uh, with that, a huge congratulations to everybody, very much deserved, and thank you for your continued work. Thank you incredibly. Um, it is, you know, it was a difficult year. Um, as, as Eric said, um, we're, we're not insensitive to what we know is a lot of economic harm that comes with drought and that these curtailments um, are also uh, impacting. But your engagement in the watershed, uh, the trust, that has continued to be gained, not importantly with the communities, but also with our state agencies so that uh, we have a unified response in the watershed so that we're able to continue to help the community adapt to what are incredible circumstances and here help balance um, what, are, what are gonna unfortunately need to be a continued discussion and balancing. And there, I'm really thankful that we're able to take this moment to, to, to step back and to be thankful for the incredible dedication that you have all displayed this last year. But um, regrettably, and as, as Eric said, with a dry January and the conditions we find ourselves, we're going to continue to need to uh, tap your, your incredible passion, your dedication to this work in this next year as well, as we continue to have to adapt to whatever it is Mother Nature will provide us. But what we continue to, to strive here and what you've been able to do is provide some certainty in the watershed as to how uh, the curtailment can, can unfold in a way that, again, is protective of these, these many uh, challenges that we have, but certainly extinction of, of species is, is front of mind amongst them. So uh, just thank you incredibly. And uh, please, uh, Vice Chair, do you have any words or uh, any other board members? I do, and uh, just wanna give my personal thanks to the entire team and just am really uh, grateful for how things have evolved in the watershed. And I uh, think back to the time when I first came to the board where we were quite challenged all the way across the board, uh, not just in terms of our understanding of the watershed, but also uh, communication. And uh, uh, Chair Esquivel, I couldn't agree more, just that building of trust. Um, I continue to hear from stakeholders um, regarding concerns, but also regarding opportunities and good ideas. And so I look forward to continuing to work with you all, the uh, local NGO advocates, uh, the farmers, uh, the counties, just all, all that are um, uh, continuing to be engaged and put good ideas out there and continue to work together. So thank you so much. Sorry about the crying baby in the background. <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair. Any other words from uh, fellow board members? Okay. And so thank you guys in incredibly. And you know what, 
what I appreciate as well is the involvement of Region One here, uh, and importantly, uh, it's you know this is cross division the work that's being done, and have to give nod as well to DIT. I know between the Russian River watershed, the Delta watershed here, you know, Scott and Shasta up in the Klamath, where um, it's a it's a lot of information that we're having to take in, a lot of engagement from from communities and from water rights holders needing to be able to easily provide information to us uh, in a way that helps us all be better decision makers amongst each other. So um, can't, can't think enough as well DIT here amongst um, what is an incredible amount of technical work and um, look forward to, to the year ahead. So thank you all. Virtual awkward clap. And this is where you know we would in here, I'm gonna screen print quickly. Uh, so uh, you should smile if I can find my screen print. There it is, okay. All right, thanks. That's our, our photo. I mean, usually we would like sit up there and do a, an awkward photo. So we had that at least. Thank you all, really appreciative. And thank you, Eric, for, for making sure to highlight uh, your team and their good work. Okay, that now we can move on to public forum. I believe we have um, a handful of speakers here, uh, about four or so, and we can begin uh, with Conrad Fisher. And again, a public forum is an opportunity for uh, any member of the public wishing to address uh, the board or any member generally um, and uh, on an item that's not already uh, calendared or pending before the board. Uh, Mr. Fisher. Hi, am I on? Yes, good morning. Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Conrad Fisher with Water Climate Trust. Um, since this award just happened, I would also express my gratitude to Eric and the entire staff who made that happen, uh, the emergency regs on the Scott and Shasta. Um, I've been involved in flows on climate tributaries since last century, and this is monumental. It was a huge task. Um, so that brings me here that, to my point today. I'm here to ask that we also begin to take action or take action to establish interim and or permanent in-stream flow requirements that are consistent with existing laws. And I would argue that to actually implement our best laws, we do need interim or permanent requirements. Um, and this issue, as hopefully you saw with the Scott and Shasta is fundamental, whether you care about climate resilience, drought, water security for family farmers, biodiversity, or racial equity, as it is eloquently described in the Water Board's racial equity action plan or resolution and soon to be action plan. Um, as you know, California has spent decades and millions of dollars on this issue already. Uh, and it looks like the state has millions more, but the salmon want water and not money necessarily. Um, and they need it. They can't wait uh, more decades for more processes. So getting to my ask, the people involved in the environmental flow setting process, whether from a scientific or legal side, still don't have a unified or clear idea of what the water board needs to establish permanent or in-stream flow requirements. And I have spoken with many people on this call about it and different people have different ideas and they slash we need clarity on this. So my ask of the board and staff attorneys is that you provide this clarity in the form of written official guidance, maybe ultimately rulemaking, I'm open, but the world needs to know where the goalpost is because for decades we have not known. Um, and ultimately to answer the question, uh, what does the water board need legally and scientifically to establish in-stream flow requirements, either interim or permanent? Um, and I'll just briefly touch on the science side, legal for another day on the science side of the equation. The California Environmental Flows Framework is done. And for those of you who don't know, that was complete through a water board contract of a few million dollars to UC Davis. California Water Action Plan is underway. Uh, it's being stalled, it appears, on the Shasta, but it's moving pretty fast on the Ventura. And Department of Fish and Wildlife has provided in-stream flow recommendations for several imperiled California rivers, including the Scott, but not yet the Shasta. Um, and I will just say that the scientists involved in these processes care deeply, um, and they and the taxpayers funding them deserve to know what an in-stream flow requirement must look like in order for the water board to actually produce an in-stream flow requirement. In other words, what does a scientific in-stream flow recommendation need to look like to result in in-stream flows? Because up to now, mostly they haven't. And the answers I get as to why are, are very different depending on who you ask. So it'd be nice to have the goalpost not move anymore. Uh, so please provide the necessary guidance so we don't uh, waste more decades and millions of dollars talking and writing about how much water fish need without actually giving it to them. So thank you for all of that. And again, none of this 
is in any way to cast shade on or undermine the amazing work already done on the Scott Shasta and the emergency regs. So thank you all. Please consider my recommendation. The clerk has my email address if anybody wants to talk further. Thank you kindly, Mr. Fisher. Really appreciate your good comments. And yes, um, although uh, good work this last year and, and good progress, still, still a lot to be done. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up David Webb. Did, is it Justin Light? Uh, David Webb, I think it's who, oh, I'm, I apologize. I, I sometimes look over at my speaker card as opposed to the, the oh. squirrel. Uh, I think we do uh, want you up here next, Mr. Light, apologize. Yeah, uh, Justin Light. Oh, so I, I'm, is it my turn? It is your turn, I apologize, Mr. Light. Oh, Good morning. No, no problem, thanks for, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to speak with you guys today. Um, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army, and I, I served during the Afghanistan War. Uh, when I came back, uh, I worked in public service, and I uh, became a, a certified operator of Distribution 2 and a Treatment 2. I also have like a Class A license with the Tankers endorsement and HAZMAT. But despite all the investment in my academics, um, I from since 2016, I've been trying to get a job into the water industry and uh, unsuccessfully. Um, I've been, I've probably interviewed like 45 different times over the last 40, uh, uh, over the last six years, trying to get a water district to hire me. And in my experience is that they don't honor the providence of the board and the license itself. Um, they, they, they say, well, you know, it's, it's like, for me, I would say it was an upwards of an $18,000 investment to go through the schooling and, uh, and, the, you know, the, the buy-in of the academics and, you know, uh, with all, all the water districts, they, they want you to have a, a class A license with the tankers usually. And so that's, that's a, that's an investment that I put in my, to myself, uh, that I put forward into these job interviews. Um, and they they look past it. They look past it, and they they say, uh, you know, they have this arbitrary uh, barometer where they say, well, what is your experience and what is your experience? <clears throat> but with, with my experience, every water district is unique. Uh, it has unique ways of uh, uh, getting the water, has uh, unique problems, uh, and to deal with, you know, so. It's 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 not just about your experience and having experience in a wa in a water district. It's about your academic acumen to put forward good ideas and problem solve on on the fly. Um, but water districts, I've proven shown to me over the last five years, over like forty six different agencies, they're not allowing eager and bright people that are that want to work in water to join water districts, um, private and uh, public, uh, you know, as far as like uh, being a government agencies. Nothing that you can do gets you a job in my, my experience. Um, you could have every qualification on the interview and, they, and they, they, they don't hire you. And I think what's going on uh, with this with this look, this look that I have is that they're 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 refusing to hire people that are not, are not already working in a water district, and so you have a pool of people that say, say if I'm in Acme Water District, and I just want to move into another area, well, you're going to ace out everybody that it doesn't have that worked in a water district, whether you have a license or not. And so you just have a whole bunch of people moving around water districts. And, um, and I think that's, I, want, I kind of, the reason why I want to speak today is because I think I want to sound an alarm that this is happening so that the board is aware of it. And, you know, that is going to, it's going to be, I just see that that's going to be disastrous. That if you, if you never let new people into the water district, if you can have a D2, if you can have a, a veteran that has a D2 and T2 license that has a um, 
Class A license with a hazmat and dangerous endorsement, that's bringing that to the water district, that's showing up and bringing that to the water district. And, and then, you you know, 45 different agencies can't uh, onboard somebody like that. There's something that, there's something that's going on that, you know, we, that we need to get to the bottom of. Um, and they're not letting new people into the, the, the they're not there's not letting new operators into the um system now you have about like nine thousand uh operators at the d2 level and even lower op license operators at the d3 level but you only can get three d3 licenses if you are in a water district um, i i really appreciate you you bringing this up mr light um yeah. i know you know right now workforce development and making sure that we continue to ensure there's pathways into the water sector uh is really important and you know i i i, I hear your frustration there and and i appreciate that you've taken the time and and here you know gotten through and uh, got the certifications what I'll, I'll flag is i know that um I, you know and i was trying to quickly um look it up but i know is at least of a couple of years ago there was an effort um, to create uh, at the state legislature a program that was for veterans uh, in the water sector specifically. And I know, but um, in practice, they're repro they're repudiating uh, they're repudiating veterans. They're not hiring veterans. Yeah. Well, again, I I and and so I I I recommend. Um, I know Jose Martinez from Ote Water District, the general manager there, is very passionate about making sure that our veterans are having pathways into the water sector. So. Um, what I'll do is I have your contact information and I'll, uh, cool. I'll connect you to um, uh, some folks to be able to have a discussion. Uh, I appreciate you coming to well, the board I mean, and I making sure to stay in Northern California because mm -hmm. I, I okay. wanted to stay in Northern California. But no, I, I understand yeah. that. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, we're, you know, I'm, I'm sure that that's a genuine that uh, the person in Orange County, but where are the other water districts? What are they doing? You know, because yeah. they're, they're not. I'm just, yeah, I'm just it, and I don't want to, I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm just, I'm, why is it happening? It needs mm -hmm. to change because I, it's going to lead to, neg I think, in my opinion, it's negligence. And I, I just want to move the board to say, like, um, you can't be negligent. If you, you know, if you have D2 operators, why don't you have a D1? Why don't you have someone that doesn't have experience so that they can learn your system? And so that when, you, when your chief operators are ready to go, you know, adios to retirement, then you can have people that, are not picking up your system in a red ball and then right. they, they can, you know, they yeah. can move they forward. They can actually, you know? yeah, you have continuity yeah. so of that's, good that, operations. That's, that's, yeah. that's my point. I appreciate your time. I, I appreciate yours uh, tremendously, Mr. Light. And I will follow up with you. So thank you. I appreciate yeah. your time this thank morning. You. Thank, thank you. Have a good morning. Bye. You too. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, David Webb. Good morning, Mr. Webb. Uh, should be, there you are. Good morning, and thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of your very short, long agenda, I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm speaking as a member of Friends of the Shasta River and, and want to speak to the Shasta River. We really appreciate the, the huge steps you took this summer with drought protection. Looks like, unfortunately, we're going to be facing them again this summer. But in reality, I can only voice what one of the members of an irrigation district voiced this summer when I was at one of their meetings where he said, how come we need 50 CFS in a drought year and 10 CFS is plenty in a normal year? We've got to recognize that we do have normal years and we need to prepare for them now while we can. And sometimes too, it's not sufficient for a board such as yourselves to sit back and wait for the Department of Fish and Wildlife to come up with a flow recommendation. Sometimes it's important to take the bull by the horns and, and say, we need this recommendation and if, if need be work through the Department of Conservation and say, get on it, please. We need it. We need it in time and, and we're not getting it at the pace we've been at. And that, that's my main message. The Shasta River is what's going to keep tribal fishermen fishing. It's what's going to keep commercial fishermen fishing because it's where the bulk of the wild salmon are going to come from and go back to in the Klamath Basin. And it's the Klamath that's constraining harvest pretty much on the West Coast most years that it gets constrained. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Appreciate your comments this morning. Thank you. And uh, last, we have Colleen Hunt. Good morning. 
Um, my name is Colleen Hunt with Stone Creek Environmental Consulting in Santa Rosa, California. And I wanted to give public comment today on concerns I have related to the status of the statewide trash provisions. These are provisions adopted by the board in 2015. And in terms of municipal stormwater specifically, it gave municipal stormwater permit holders a 10 year time frame to comply with the zero trash discharge from the MS4. Um, the, the regulatory mechanism to start that time frame is embedded within permits. And so for municipal stormwater, that's NPDES permits. And there's also a drop dead compliance date of December, 2030 to meet that zero discharge. Um, and my main concern is that a lot of the permits um, don't yet have the trash provisions incorporated into them. And this mostly has to do with delays in renewing MS4 permits. And you can look at the statewide phase two uh, general permit, which expired in 2018 and is up to be renewed. And the last update I got is that permit might be adopted next year. So, you know, there's significant delays in renewing these MPDES permits and getting these trash provision requirements incorporated into these permits to start the, I'll say, quote, 10 year time frame. Because clearly in 2022, with a drop dead um, due date of 2030, um, if a municipality doesn't yet have the trash provisions in their permit, they're not going to be given the full 10 years that was intended when the provisions were originally adopted. And in addition to make it a little more complicated, um, every municipality that selected track two was given a 13383 order to develop a trash implementation plan to show the regional boards on how they intend to comply with the provisions using track two. And I can't speak statewide, but here on the North Coast, those plans were never approved or commented on. They were due in December of 2018. Uh, municipalities did not receive comments on these plans or approval. And so even if municipalities wanted to start implementing their approach to complying with these provisions without having the approval from the board on their approach, there's a risk there because they could start, you know, assuming that the board, you know, wants that the board would approve their plan, they could go and implement all these actions. And then the board can come back and say, well, we never approved that and we don't like it. And so you have to do something completely different. So there's a real issue here in terms of the, I guess, equity in of giving municipalities the full 10 years in which they were, um, I think the provisions intended to give municipalities to comply with these trash provisions. So my request would be to have an update on how many permits do have these provisions incorporated how many trash plans have been approved? Look at some information. You know, it could be an anomaly here on the North Coast and with the statewide permit. Um, but, you know, I'd be really interested in seeing like, where are we with the implementation of these provisions? And then I think ultimately my request is that this board consider amending the provisions to give that 10 year time frame that is not being um, fairly given to the municipalities that these um, uh, requirements haven't yet been incorporated into their provisions. I think this is the only governing body that would be able to do that um, because you talk to on the regional board scale and their hands are tied because they say, well, it's in the provisions that December 2030 is that drop dead date and we can't do anything about that. And so I really think this is the only avenue is addressing this board to um, correct this situation. 
uh, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hunt, for, for addressing the board today and raising uh, the concern here. I know the trash uh, policy is really critical. Uh, we we uh, talk about implementation often uh, with a number of our regions, but having something of an informational, uh, it's something that very much to consider. And I really do appreciate, again, the flag. And there'll be certainly further discussion here at the board at some point. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. That wraps up our uh, public forum speakers and appreciate um, everyone who's uh, taking the time to address the board this morning. That then now brings us to um, our official board business and our first item, which will be uh, consideration of adoption of the board meeting minutes from the February 1st board meeting. Do I have, uh, are there any uh, edits, anything uh, to adjust on that? And then otherwise would entertain a motion. I'll move to adopt the um, meeting minutes. I have a second. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you, board member. Uh, Ms. Townsend, can you please call a roll call vote? Yes. Board member Morgan? Aye. Board member McGuire? Aye. Board member Firestone? Abstain. Thank you. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. As always, a nail biter on the minutes. And so thank you everyone. They're, they've been adopted and we can move on to item number two, which is an informational item here, uh, drought update and current hydrologic conditions. I believe uh, Mr. Ekdahl, back up. You'll lead us off. Thank you. Good morning again, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. Uh, We'll provide a quick update just from the division today. As a reminder, there are no updates from the Division of Drinking Water and then DFA will, or Division of Financial Assistance will provide an update at the next board meeting on March 1st. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael Macon who will run through the uh, first set of slides for the drought update and then I'll follow up with some updates on the various watersheds that we're working in throughout the state. So next slide, please. All right, uh, Michael, I'll hand it off to you. Okay, uh, I'm not familiar with the drought update, uh, <laughs> but good morning, uh, Chair Esquivel and other board members. I'm gonna give you a brief rundown of the hydro hydrologic conditions across the state. Uh, just to start off, uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide again. All right, so uh, precipitation has remained pretty steady since the last storm in December. Uh, we've had a really dry January and moving into a dry February so far. Uh, current precipitation in the northern Sierra is holding at 31.5 inches. Uh, and next slide. In the San Joaquin Valley, uh, similar pattern, we're holding at 20.2 inches. Uh, we're just breaking through into the average rainfall below average. Uh, for San Joaquin at this time of year. Uh, next slide, please. And in the two-layer basin, again, very dry January and February, we're sitting at 13.0 inches for the water year. Uh, next slide. Similar to precipitation, snowpack has remained fairly steady since uh, end of December. Uh, in the northern regions, we're sitting at 79% of the snowpack to date. In the central region, 83% of average to date. And in the south, 83% average to date. So that's slowly dropping as the year goes on. Uh, next slide, please. Taking a high level look of, at reservoirs across the state, uh, most are sitting below the historical averages with the exceptions of Folsom Reservoir and Bullard's Bar. but we've, we've been in worse conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So taking a closer look at Shasta, uh, we're currently sitting around 1.6 million acre feet. That's about 500,000 acre feet short of where we were at this time last year. Next slide, please. Taking a look at Oroville, uh, we've improved since last year. We're currently sitting at about 1.6 million acre feet, similar to Shasta. Uh, 
but we're kind of tapering off and plateauing as inflows start to match outflows following the dry January. Uh, next slide, please. For Folsom, probably the breadwinner of the, the storms this past year, uh, sitting at 530,000 acre feet and holding at that flood control curve at the moment. Uh, you know, we're hoping for rain moving forward from here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, New Maloney's Reservoir is currently at 984,000 acre feet. Uh, fairly steady incline, but tapering off in the recent days. Again, praying for rain moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Taking a look at the other reservoirs across the state, uh, Kachuma Reservoir is at 92,000 acre feet out of its 193,000 acre feet total. So about 48% capacity, 70% of average. Uh, Diamond Valley Lake is sitting at 73% capacity with 592,000 acre feet. And San Luis Reservoir is at 920,000 acre feet of its total 2 million capacity. Uh, so about 45% capacity and just shy of 60% of average to date. Uh, next slide, please. Currently, Term 91 is not in effect. Uh, we're currently in balanced conditions in the Delta and we're continuing to monitor term 91 uh, daily. We're currently holding around negative 3000 CFS, uh, but if it starts to approach zero, we'll start to look at re-implementing re and notifying water users of that. Uh, next slide. So looking at drought conditions across California, uh, majority of the state is currently sitting at at least moderate drought with most of the state in a severe drought conditions. Uh, we're only seeing extreme drought in some regions in the northern part of the state. Uh, next slide, please. Looking at the Colorado Basin, it's a similar pattern, um, more, a little more of the extremes. <laughs> more of this basin is sitting in extreme drought than California but also more of it sitting at better conditions and abnormally dry conditions um, in the southern part of the basin. Uh, but still, drought conditions permeate through both the California Basin and Colorado Basin at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at the seasonal dry outlook uh, throughout California and most of the Southwest, uh, drought is expected to persist through at least April 30th. Uh, with some reprieve from drought conditions in the Northwest in Oregon and Washington. Uh, but we're looking at drought conditions for the remainder of the spring, at least. Uh, all right, next slide. Take a look at monthly temperatures. Uh, so specifically to February, we have a above average chance of having warmer temperatures it, throughout most of California, the exception of Northern California, which has equal chances of above and below average temperatures. So likely looking at a warm February for most of the state. Uh, next slide, please. Looking at precipitation, uh, this is probably the least encouraging figure, but we're looking at another dry month in February uh, with pretty high chances of below average rainfall in throughout the central parts of California. And February is supposed to be one of our wettest months of the year, so this is not encouraging moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. And I believe this is where I hand it back off to Eric. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yep, I'll pick it up from here. Just a, a few other notes on some of the slides that we saw earlier. The kind of uh, curves where we show the percent of precipitation received to date and how we're just about now hitting the, the shaded light blue average part of the precipitation. You know, at, at this point, we're losing about, we're falling behind by about one to two percent per day. Uh, and so those graphs were generated on February 10th. It's been another five days since then. So we are another five to 10% behind relative to what we've seen 
There's no precipitation forecast through the remainder of February, and there is very little precipitation in the long range forecast for March. All of this is pointing to, again, some pretty dire conditions statewide for drought. Uh, and you know we've been tracking and watching it progress, but it really does seem like things are moving significantly more concerning uh, and will continue to do so over the next couple of weeks. As I noted earlier, we've just had the record uh, driest January, February time period in state recorded history. And again, there's no precipitation forecast for the next two weeks. Uh, that's a remarkably dry set of weeks in what is normally our driest time of the year. Uh, Vice Chair, do you have a question? Yeah, I do, thank you. Um, so uh, this notion of falling behind, I'm assuming that takes into account precip and also temperature, early it's snow melt? It's just looking at pure uh, precipitation in, in that sense. And it doesn't take into account temperature. It doesn't take into account what might be happening to snowpack. And that's a different set of graphs and a different uh, calculation, but we are falling behind there as well. The immense snowpack that we saw in late December, you know, it was 75, 80 degrees in parts of the Central Valley last week and last weekend. That's exacerbating snow melt, uh, exacerbating snow loss. And then you pick up these strong winds that we're having today that additionally feeds into the evaporation that's affecting uh, just soil moisture content, but also snowpack as well. So again, continuing ongoing concerning conditions. Right, thank you. So with that uh, unhappy bit of context, we'll move into what conditions are like in some of the other watersheds that we're working on statewide. In Mill and Deer Creek, uh, the curtailment has been in effect since October 15th and the 50 cubic feet per second uh, in-stream flow threshold has been maintained since that time. Uh, there have been ongoing meetings and there uh, will be some additional meetings. There's one in the Mill Creek watershed on February 9th and another one on February 24th to talk about interim and long-term resolution of needed measures to address fisheries. We can follow up with those in March and April once we learn more about them. Next slide, please. In the Russian River, uh, the curtailments have been suspended through March 1st. We'll take another look uh, later in the week to see if those curtailments need to be suspended for an additional set of time or whether or not we need to start reimposing some curtailments based on priority. Uh, compliance, 93% of right holders who have received a compliance order have responded to that survey. That's a really good compliance rate. And again, when we've shown the uh, compliance by volume, we're at about 99%, if not even a little bit higher. So uh, a note of thanks to the stakeholders in that watershed for just reporting and following up and continuing to kind of engage with us going forward. And those are available on the Power BI dashboard on our drought website. Next slide, please. Lake Mendocino storage. Uh, things had peaked up around 44,000 cubic, or sorry, acre feet. Things have been slowly drifting downward a little bit and then kind of hovering around neutral for the last week or two. Uh, we'll see where conditions continue to go over the next two weeks as conditions remain hot and dry. Next slide, please. In the Scott and Shasta River, uh, in the Scott, we had suspended curtailments through February 11th based on uh, flows being above the 200 cubic feet per second requirement. There's uh, a fair amount of snow melt going on right now, which has increased flows as of yesterday. They were at 296 and actually had gone up a little bit even after the point where we had updated the slide. So they were over 300 for a while. And so the curtailments have been suspended through February 17th. Uh, the downside is that the snowmelt we're seeing now is snowmelt that would have otherwise occurred in April and May. And so unless that snowpack is replenished, there could be an earlier uh, drop off in terms of flows. We have to kind of see how things play out through March and April. And in Shasta, all curtailments are suspended through February 28th, so long as flows are above 135 cubic feet per second. Next slide, please. 
here's a graph showing again kind of where things are uh, on the Scott. This is a couple days out of date. So you can see the blue line is actually below the red line there. It did dip down below 200 for a couple of days, but we didn't lift the curtailments. We wanted to see how the snow melt snowmelt modeling uh, worked out and it did in fact rise pretty sharply over the last couple of days. Next slide, please. And in the chassis, you can see that it's maintained above that 135 CFS uh, threshold for quite some time. Next slide, please. And that I think wraps up the update for today. There's no DDW or DFA updates this week, uh, but as always, we have our drought webpage and our email subscription list for additional information. With that, I'll uh, see if there are any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Ekdahl. Just really appreciate uh, the incredible work that uh, Division of Water Rights continues to do, and especially the nuance of, of uh, managing curtailments here in real time, um, looking at the data, incorporating things like snow melt, and having uh, the appropriate touch uh, where you know, we're not uh, being uh, overly eager to, to reimpose, but really looking at the data and saying, how best do we not pull people on and off curtailment, but really do so in a way that's getting to these goals. Um, you know, with, with the, the, the reality of where our hydrology is presenting this year, uh, you know, I think we, we need to continue just to assume a worst case scenario. Given where we are in the water year, we have to assume that um, we don't get another drop, that, you know, that we don't receive real significant precipitation and really model out here all amongst us and importantly with communities what does that look like then in midsummer here, where we'll know we'll be um, in, in the midst of um, the, our, our dry period in the summer and, and at the height of where our challenges will really um, occur, even as they seem to be occurring earlier in the water year. So now's the time to uh, discuss, now's the time to prepare. And I know that um, this board will continue to make sure we have discussions that help us best understand our decision-making space in the face of Again, what uh, we can try to plan out is something of a worst case scenario where we don't receive any significant precipitation for the rest of this water year. So just thank you. I know uh, your teams and a lot of folks here at the board and our sister agencies are, are discussing just that. So look forward to just further having an opportunity here at the board to understand how we're preparing and what we're doing. So thank you. Any questions from uh, fellow board colleagues or uh, comments or uh, direction? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, oh, board member. If I could. So uh, yeah, thank you for the presentations. Really helpful and um, sobering, certainly, uh, especially looking at Shasta and Oroville and, and the fact that they they haven't refilled. And what really stood out to me is just how close the current storage is to the 76, 77 drought levels. And um, you know, if that's not a wake up call, I, I really don't know what is in terms of, um, you know, how proactive I think we need to be here in making uh, the tough decisions as soon as possible. Uh, and I'm, you know, been on the board for three years now and reflecting back as to the last year and the challenges that we faced there and not having all the information and having to make tough decisions. Um, and some of that happened a little bit later uh, than maybe uh, was best. And so I'm thinking, you know, you were just were talking about the curtailments and, and the potential for reimposing those. And so I was just wondering, you know, we, we learned a lot last year. We did, I think you all did amazing work in, in getting those into place. Um, what's your sort of forecast for this year in terms of maybe revisions that might be needed to, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking broadly about the Russian, about Mill, about Shasta, the Bay Delta. Are you envisioning um, a need to go back and take another look at the emergency regulations from last year and make some modifications? Yeah, no, that's a, a great set of questions. And the very short answer is yes, we do anticipate taking another look at the regulations and bringing them back to the board for minor modifications or maybe in some circumstances, more significant modifications going forward. Uh, the emergency regulations are in place for up to one year following adoption. So the first that would come before you would be the Russian River that was adopted on June 15th of last year. Uh, we are in the process right now of looking at kind of where conditions are. The Russian River is also the hardest because if you get a couple more precipitation events in March uh, and you refill Lake Mendocino, which you could pretty quickly, then they're kind of out of the woods. If we don't get anything, uh, then it 
precipitous, precipitously drops off and we're in kind of the same situation that we were last year. I think one of the things that we're contemplating in the Russian River is how to address uh, stream depletions caused by groundwater pumping. And that's a challenging set of data. It's a challenging topic, yet we kind of estimate that there was between three and 4,000 acre feet per month of stream depletion caused by groundwater pumping just immediately next to the main stem of the river itself. So we're kind of engaging stakeholders now in that process. We'll go through, uh, again, a, a very rigorous public process where we'd like to have drafts out. Uh, we want to engage with board members beforehand to kind of just uh, get your input and feedback on how best to approach this scenario and what might be accomplished and what could be accomplished. And we're aiming to do that over the next couple of months. Uh, in the Delta watershed, those were adopted in, I think, August 2nd. So we'll have a little bit longer there, but with the regulations in place, it also means that if things continue to be dry, there's the potential for earlier curtailments as well. And that's going to raise, I think, additional challenges for our methodology, just making sure that we have the data right and the highest degree of data that we can possibly get before we make a decision, as well as for uh, water diverters, especially those that are diverting for uh, an irrigation season where they may already be curtailed by May or June. As we look at the curtailments that we have in place right now, you know, there is indication that we could continue or we could increase the level of curtailments even more right now. We're holding off on doing that until we've addressed some questions in our methodology and we plan on uh, updating that over the next couple of weeks but that could already affect say storage uh, diversions or diversions of storage. And we want to make sure that we're capturing the water we can now uh, in preparation for what could be a very, very dry summer. So there's a, a number of challenges. Uh, Scott Shasta, uh, we continue to work on local cooperative solutions. And I think we're hopeful that we may get one or two, ideally more, uh, and we wanna kind of set those up. Those uh, regulations come before the board again on August 17th or so. So a lot going on throughout the summer for sure. Uh, and again, it's gonna require that we maybe don't start wholesale from scratch, but I think that a lot of the stakeholder engagement that we did last year almost becomes more important as we continue to revise and modify the regulations and contemplate bringing them back before you for adoption. And so it almost increases the workload in some sense, but it's very necessary. And we're going to think through how to do it and what the timing is for it. And that process is underway now. Really appreciate that. Thank you. It's very helpful. And uh, I appreciate that you're thinking through those nuances and just recognize that, yes, public engagement, getting with our stakeholders as quickly as, as possible is really key here to success for this year because it, it looks like it's going to be a challenge. So thank you. Thank you both. Other colleagues, and we have about uh, four commenters or three. Okay, hearing none, then we can go to our first commenter, Kimberly Burt. Kara Scovell, I do believe that Ms. Burt is not on the platform. Okay, thank you. Then uh, next, I believe, is Dante John Nomalini. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, I was very concerned about the interim operation plan that uh, has come out of the litigation between the state and the federal government dealing with the application of the Endangered Species Act uh, biological opinions. That interim plan, I urge you not adopt that without further review and involvement of the public because the court case is not a public forum. It is a very limited uh, party situation. I don't know what the state board's participation has been, but the interim operation plan um, has forecasting associated with it that was discussed at the CalFed uh, conference call 
and it's uncertain as to what the basis of that forecasting is. Uh, it sounded like the forecasting that's been done in the recent past has been based on 51 years of past hydrology. And we know that we've had the project's failure uh, to be able to meet the water quality standards in a number of years here. And it's obvious that climate change has occurred to some degree, and therefore I'm very alarmed to see uh, both the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project uh, increase their allocations, and particularly concerning are those that are exported. What's happened in the past is that water that was exported could have been used to meet the standards. And I don't think we ought to allow that in the future. And of course, we recognize some improvement in the approach by staff of the state board for certain, somewhat in what we heard from DWR. The Bureau, I'm not so sure, but we shouldn't allow the burden to be transferred uh, onto the local uh, water users in the watershed that have a priority by law. And we're very concerned about having any export of water that is needed to meet the water quality uh, standards. Now, when you exported water last year, the standard for salinity control was reduced by, uh, by 1,000 cubic feet per second, and yet you allowed 1,500 cubic feet per second of export to take place. Now, you didn't use, or the projects didn't use the full 1,500, but it, again, it was another situation where exports had they been curtailed, which we think is required by law, that water would have been available to meet the water quality standards in June and July. So we urge that we relook at this operation plan. I don't know whether you, you people have been involved in that or not, but we ask that you not adopt that uh, without further public input, uh, which isn't gonna occur in the legal action. The court case also involves the board being a participant in a per, uh, WOMAN, I think they, is the acronym for it, which is a series of non-public meetings that involve the board, DWR, the Bureau, the fishery agencies, and we think it's unhealthy to have the regulators and the active operators of the projects, uh, since they're both in the same governmental structure, operating in private. So we would urge that we open that process and we look at meeting health and safety needs in the valley from Friant and those sources that are already down there. You don't have to export water from the north to solve those health and safety problems. Uh, they can be solved locally and they should be. Water that's exported now that's held in San Luis should remain available if we need it to meet Delta standards. And that can be done through exchanges or even direct uh, releases to the San Joaquin River. So anyway, that's my comment. And really the urging is that the board itself get involved and get us involved, the public involved, uh, in the operation plan for the following period, which I think runs from February 22nd to the end of September. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Namalini. Uh, I'll note, you know, this item is just on our hydrology update. The next item will be a discussion on uh, our reconsideration and petitions on the temporary urgency change petition. And so we'll consider part of your uh, comment here as also yeah, um, directed toward be, that I'm item. And I think you're you're on that item as well. So we'll call you up then as well. But just to flag, we'll we'll consider some of your comment here as part of that discussion. So I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Eric Oriana. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Good morning, board members and staff. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide a comment today. Uh, I wanted to start off by uh, thanking staff for the work over the last year uh, to provide really great uh, informational updates on the drought. I always find it really insightful. And so uh, really thank you. Uh, and you know, the, the updates that have been shared um, today uh, really signify that January and February have been some of the driest months on record. 
Uh, we all know that January and February is usually a critical time for precipitation. Um, and I share this to center us in the likelihood that we'll continue to face the impacts of a drought throughout the state. Um, and with that said, the most significant drought impacts we've seen um, over the last year is when households lose access to running water in their homes uh, as a result of large agricultural wells depleting groundwater levels near drinking water wells. Um, since most, uh, if not all GSAs have not implemented domestic well impact mitigation programs, uh, we urge the board to work with the administration to ensure that the governor's proposed additional 250 million for drought impacts reaches frontline communities. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we urge you to ensure that the Department of Water Resources requires GSAs to be financially liable for the drinking water impacts their mismanagement is causing today. Uh, for far too long, the state of California has subsidized the environmental degradation uh, of the California agricultural industry. Uh, and with the impacts of climate change at our doorstep, we cannot continue to conduct business as usual. We have to be clear that every Californian's human right to water is not less important than another's pursuit of wealth. Uh, and I've recognized that I didn't share uh, my name or organization. So my name is Eric Guadiana, a policy advocate with Community Water Center. So uh, thank you all for letting me share those comments and look forward to continue to work with the State Water Board. Thank you, Mr. Adriana. Appreciate your, your comments today and continued engagement. Much appreciated. Thank you. Any other comments from fellow board colleagues on this item or discussion? Okay. With that, thank you, Mr. Ekdahl. Much appreciated. And uh, that closes item number two. Um, let's go ahead and move on to item number three. Um, and at this point, I'd like to call up Diane Riddle. And uh, I won't Sometimes I read the full name of the item. I will not in this case, but this is consideration of a proposed order uh, regarding last year's uh, TUCP uh, on to take action on petitions for reconsideration of last year's temporary urgency change petition and also the temperature management plan. So Ms. Riddle. Great. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and board members. Again, my name is Diane Riddle. I'm one of the assistant deputy directors in the Division of Water Rights. I'll introduce today's item and then turn it over to Aaron Forsman to complete the staff presentation. Next slide, please. The slide identifies the topics that we plan to discuss today. First, I'll start with, with some brief background to provide context to the proposed actions of the board today, including a timeline of the activities leading up to today's proposed action and a review of the December 15th draft order on reconsideration. I'll then turn it over to Aaron to discuss comments and major themes that we received on the draft order on reconsideration and recommended changes to the draft order to address the comments received. Next slide, please. So I'll just provide a little bit of background on the timeline. Um, the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation submitted a temporary urgency change petition or TUCP on May 17th of last year in response to the dry hydrology, um, the low expected runoff from snowmelt and the depleted reservoir storage conditions. The TUCP requested modifications to Delta outflow requirements for the protection of fish and wildlife from June 1st to July 31st, movement of the Western Delta salinity requirement for the protection of agriculture from Edmonton to Three Mile Slough, which allows salinity to intrude approximately 2.5 miles further inland, and modifications to limits on exports at the Southern Delta pumping facilities. The executive director conditionally approved the TUCP to modify D1641 requirements on June 1st, 2021. The next action, the Bureau um, of Reclamation submitted the final Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan on May 28th of 2021, pursuant to Water Right Order 90-5, requiring a temperature management plan when reclamation determines that it cannot reasonably maintain a temperature value of 56 degrees Fahrenheit at Red Bluff Diversion Dam on the Sacramento River. The final temperature management plan included an end of September storage goal for Shasta Reservoir of at least 1.25 million acre feet and an average daily temperature target of 55 degrees Fahrenheit on the Sacramento River at the Highway 44 bridge, which is 55 miles upstream of Red Bluff Diversion Dam. The executive director conditionally approved the temperature management plan on June 10th of 2021. 
We received five petitions for reconsideration of the executive director's actions on the TUCP and two petitions for reconsideration of the approval of the Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan. The draft order on reconsideration um, responds to those petitions for reconsideration as and addresses some of the comments received um, in addition to the petitions. Uh, that was released, a draft was released on December 15th of 2021. Written comments on the December 15th draft were due on January 7th and the board held a public workshop on January 5th to receive oral public comments. Based on those comments, the uh, division staff released a draft order, a revised order on reconsideration on February 4th um, with the agenda for today's board meeting. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the December 15th draft order on re reconsideration, which responds to the petitions for reconsideration um, of both the TUCP and TMP, as I identified. Um, the temporary, I wanted to note, the temporary urgency change petition and temperature management plan, while they were separate actions, they were closely related. That is the reason the um, the orders on the order on reconsideration addresses both together. We did receive a number of comments on that topic. Um, and again, because they were very intricately related and the petitions for reconsideration covered both topics, they were both covered in the same order. The December 15th draft order denied in part and granted in part the petitions for reconsideration to the extent that additional conditions can improve drought management this year. The December 15th draft order included four conditions, including a requirement for reclamation to submit a Sacramento River temperature management plan for water year 2022, a requirement for DWR and reclamation to evaluate and identify minimum Delta export thresholds for meeting health and safety and wildlife refuge needs, a requirement that DWR and reclamation identify and implement needed improvements to hydrologic forecast methods, and document and report on water deliveries to their contractors. Um, next, I'll turn on Aaron Forsman will provide a summary of the comments that we received on the December 15th draft order and the revisions to the draft order in response to comments. So I will turn it over to Aaron now. Thanks, Diane. Um, good morning, Chair Esquivel, and good morning, board members. My name is Erin Forsman, and I am an Environmental Program Manager in the Division of Water Rights. As Diane mentioned, I will provide an overview of the comments that we received on the December 15 draft order on reconsideration. In recent comments on the February 4 version of the draft order, I will review proposed changes to the draft order, including new and revised conditions. And then finally, I will describe additional staff changes to the February 4, 2022 order. Next slide. We received 13 comment letters on the December 15th draft order on reconsideration from the 33 entities listed on this slide. We received both general comments for the draft order as well as recommendations for specific order conditions, which I will discuss next. Next slide. So many comments requested that the board reject or substantially revise the draft order. Those specific changes differed substantially among the comments and I'll review those in the following slides. And um, we also received many comments that it was inappropriate to rely on the interim operations plan. The interim operations plan is a proposal for operating the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project for water year 2022 in compliance with the Federal Endangered Species Act as reinitiation of consultation and litigation over the 2019 biological opinions for the operation of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project are in process. Many of the comments also identified um, an opinion that the board lacks authority to act after 90 days after um, 90 days after receiving the petitions on reconsideration, that the board doesn't have authority to include conditions for future actions or um, include actions under 90-5. 
We also received um, recommendations to generate two orders to separately discuss petitions on reconsideration for the 2021 TMP and the TUCP order separately. Comments that suggested that evidence shows the executive director decisions were unreasonable, that the pattern and practice of weakening already inadequate standards and allowing projects to harm fish and wildlife, that the facts in the order on reconsideration support acceptance of petitions for reconsideration, and that the order on reconsideration is contrary to the Delta Reform Act, which requires a reduction in reliance on the Delta for water supply. Next slide. We received comments about concerns for HABs or harmful algal blooms and aquatic weeds. Specifically, the concerns were about exposure, vulnerable communities, access to water recreation, equity, views, odor, air quality, and environmental justice. We also received a number of comments that generally called for specific board actions, including rejection of the draft order and to not act on the petitions for reconsideration to generate two orders to separately address petitions um, reconsideration for 2021 TMP and the TUCP order, to not include conditions that constrain project operations, to issue a new order that acknowledges prior decisions allowed unreasonable use of water resulting in unreasonable effects to fish and wildlife and public trust resources, and to issue a new order with terms and conditions that protect fish and wildlife, including limits on project deliveries to minimum health and safety needs for all contractors. Next slide. This slide summarizes the recommended changes to specific conditions in the December 15 draft order. Many of the comments focused on the need for additional transparency, clarification, or public participation in the regulatory process. For example, condition one, commenters requested that the Sacramento River TMP undergo independent scientific peer review prior to the state board's approval of the plan, or temperature management planning processes should have more transparency. Similarly, commenters requested that further transparency through a public process for condition two, information on human health and safety information. Let's see, I just wanna make sure I cover all the changes. Um, for condition one, um, there were suggestions to add the independent scientific peer review, remove the reference to interim operations plan, eliminate any requirements for the Sacramento River TMP and items A through E, to clarify the meaning of best available hydrologic information and detrimental temperatures, and to provide for transparency and temperature, manage, temperature planning information. Condition two, we received comments requesting public process to discuss health and safety supplies. Condition three, we didn't have any recommended comments on specific changes. And condition four, we had comments recommending um, to clarify the information that should be submitted. Okay, next slide. So this is a slide of the summary of the changes to the draft order conditions that are in the February 4 revised draft order. I will show the text changes for each one of the conditions over the next few slides, but overall the changes to the conditions aim to clarify parts of the conditions and increase the transparency in water diversion and use reporting and temperature management. The February 4th revised draft order and added a new condition, condition number five, with requirements for the harmful algal bloom and invasive aquatic weed study. Next slide. These next few slides contain the entire text of the ordering conditions with hard-coded tracks to show proposed changes. I'm not going to read the entire slide, but instead I'll point out the changes and, and I realize that they, they might be hard to see for some folks. On condition one, we made changes to subpart C, and those changes include that in evaluating the temperature management plan, the board will consider which applicable targets in the final interim operations plan approved by the court and may require additional measures pursuant to its independent authority. These changes were really intended just to clarify the role of the interim operations plan and the role of the board meaning that the board is aware that the interim operations plan is, is being processed through the courts 
and that it is necessary for um, compliance with Endangered Species Act for CVP SWP operations, and that the board has its own independent authority to make decisions with respect to the TMP and this temporary urgency, sorry, and this order on reconsideration. We also ordered um, added subpart F, which requires reclamation and coordination with other agencies and stakeholders involved in Sacramento River temperature management to make information developed in that process available as soon as practicable um, and in the process for this year, for 2022. Next slide. So these changes to condition two are intended to respond to comments and to clarify that, um, that information should be about human health and safety and identify a process where we get public input on the definition of human health and safety. So they are um, sprinkled without, throughout the um, condition, but they essentially outline the process where DWR and reclamations help present a draft report to the State Water Board at a meeting um, to receive public and board comments. So the changes to condition two really just contain additional requirements for DWR and reclamation in their reporting of water exported from the Delta by the projects for human health and safety supplies during the June 2021 TUCP order effective period. Um, and now it just requires that DWR and reclamation present the draft Delta export and human health and safety report to the board in a public meeting. Next slide. So we did not receive any specific requests for changes to condition three. However, text was added to condition three to clarify the duration that DWR and reclamation are required to provide updates to the board on hydrologic operational forecasts, as well as progress to improve forecasting methods. Next slide. Changes in revised draft condition four include text to clarify the reporting requirements for water deliveries from DWR and reclamation to contract parties on the Sacramento and Feather Rivers. The changes also correct nomenclature of the Feather River agencies, which the previous draft order referred to as settlement contractors. Next slide. Condition five is a new condition that includes additional requirements for DWR and reclamation in completing their special study on harmful algal blooms and invasive aquatic weeds. The study was required by condition eight of the June 1st TUCP order. However, input we received through oral and written comments highlighted additional information and coordination needs of the study. For example, stakeholders informed the board that current draft study report does not include all the data that was collected during 2021. So condition five requires DWR and reclamation to coordinate with stakeholders to determine if the study is required, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, to determine if additional data are available that should be incorporated into the data analyses. In addition, the study is required to summarize the impacts to the different subregions of the Delta and analyze the potential for disproportionate impacts to vulnerable communities. DWR and Reclamation shall present study results in a public board meeting and take public comments on the draft report and submit a final report to the board addressing comments as appropriate. Next slide. This slide summarizes minor changes that were made to the body of the December 15 draft order. Most changes in the body of the order were minor clarification. We added a section, section 2.8 in the background summarizing issues regarding harmful algal blooms and aquatic weeds. We added some changes to the winter run section on which is section 2.64. We modified the section describing the interim operations plan and we modified the section regarding public interest in section 4.1. Next slide. We put together these changes and we released them in a February 4 draft version of the order on reconsideration. Comments were due um, on the changes to the December 15th draft order. Comments were due on February 10th at noon. We received seven comment letters from the organizations listed on the slide. Next slide. 
These next two slides are just a summary of the comments we received on the February 4th version of the draft order. And I'll read through those. The changes in the order don't adequately address prior comments on the December 15th draft order. Appropriate notice and opportunity to be heard was not provided for new information in the draft order. Legal comments on authority to impose condition and consider additional information. Comments on summary of water supply deliveries, contracts and water rights. Condition for reporting requirements were not needed. Next slide. That there was an overemphasis on temperature management, comments on temperature science, need for all temperature modeling and other information to be publicly available. There's a recommendation for system-wide accounting for 2021 and factors affecting Shasta storage. Requirements for coordination with Delta interests and public review of the HABS report are overly burdensome and should be removed. Should deny petitions for reconsideration without additional conditions and reiteration of comments that we received on the December 15th, 2021 draft order. Next slide. We did make some subsequent changes to the February 4 draft order in response to these comments. We made very minor modifications um, to due dates in conditions two, three, four, and five. The reason for these um, changes was just in recognition that DWR and Reclamation will need additional time to complete these products and that the first version came out in December. We also made minor changes to the body of the order to add citations and clarification to section 2.6.4 on winter run Chinook salmon and section 2.65 on spring run Chinook salmon. Next slide. These slides, um, they are essentially the same ones we looked at earlier for conditions two, three, and four, but I have highlighted the changes on top of the February 4th changes. So you can see on this slide that we um, changed March to April. It's in yellow highlight. You will see these in the change sheet. In the change sheet, there isn't highlighter. We just put the highlighter here in these slides so it was easier for everyone to see considering how much text is on this slide. So in um, condition two, we're just modifying um, the due date for the draft report from March 1 to April 1. Next slide. In condition three, we've changed the date that DWR and, and Reclamation should be speaking to the board about updates to the forecast process from February to March. Next slide. For condition four, we're changing the due date from March 1st to April 1st. Next slide. And finally, the report on the HABs, we're changing the due date from March 31st, 2022 to April 30th, 2022. Next slide. So at this point, I think I'd like to request, um, Janine, can you pull up the actual change sheet? We did produce a change sheet that put all these changes together, including the small changes to section 2.64 and 2.65. Sure, no problem. One, okay. one moment. Thank you. And just to clarify, I believe I have to read these changes into the record. Just so you are aware as well that it is now posted on the agenda. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm still not seeing it. Is that just me or can others see it? No. Okay. <laughs> it's not up yet. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is the change sheet. And Janine, do I read the whole change sheet or just the changes? I'm gonna defer that to Chief Counsel Lawfer. Okay. And just given the fact that it's being posted uh, now, I would prefer that you go through and read it in the record, both for an accessibility perspective, as well as for clarity for everybody following along. 
Okay, just from the top to the bottom, just read what I see. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> okay, so we have change sheet number one circulated on February 15, 2002 for the February 15, 2022 board meeting, item number three. Changes to February 4th, 2022 proposed order taking actions on petitions for reconsideration of the executive director's June 1st, 2021 order approving a temporary urgency change petition to modified special Delta flow and water quality requirements included in decision 1641 and the executive director's June 10, 2021 Sacramento River temperature management plan approval pursuant to order 90-5. The proposed order noticed and made available to the public on February 4, 2022, contained the State Water Resources Control Board's revisions and clarifications to the December 15, 2021 draft order. As explained in the board meeting agenda for the February 15, 2021 draft order. Sorry, as explained in the board meeting agenda for the February 15, 15, 2022 board meeting proposed changes to the December 15, 2021 draft order are shown in underlying with a single underline and strikeout with a single strikeout. For ease of understanding in this change sheet, proposed changes to February 4, 2022 proposed order are shown in double underline and double strikeout. Can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Changes to section 2.0, factual and legal background, section 2.6.4. The following sentence has a single strikeout through it. Downstream rearing and migration of juveniles occurs from fall through spring when temperature conditions are typically more favorable and juveniles may experience less temperature impacts due to their ability to seek thermal refugia after egg emergence. That sentence has been removed and replaced by the following sentence. Following emergence, juveniles may experience less temperature impacts due to their ability to seek thermal refugia. Downstream rearing and migration of juveniles occurs from fall through spring when temperature conditions are typically more favorable. Section 2.65, replaced footnote 32 citation. The following citation was removed. Martin B. T., Pike A., John S. N., Hamda N., Roberts J., Lindley S. T., and Danner E. M., 2017, Phenomenological versus Biophysical Models of Thermal Stress in Aquatic Eggs, Ecology Letters, 21, pages 50 through 59. That was replaced with U.S. Environmental Protection Agency 2003 EPA Region 10 Guidance for Pacific Northwest State and Tribal Temperature Water Quality Standards, EPA, Report number 910B03002, Region 10, Office of Water, Seattle, Washington. The next change is added footnote 34 at the end of the first paragraph. This was added, Myrick, Christopher A, and Joseph J. Check, Temperature Effects on Chinook Salmon and Steelhead, a review focusing on Central Valley's, California Central Valley populations, Bay Delta Modeling Forum, 2021. The next change was we added one, oh wait, go back there. Added one sentence to the end of the second paragraph. This is the sentence that was added. Neither the approval of the Sacramento River TMP or the, okay, actually, I'm sorry. This sentence wasn't added. The sentence is already here. It's just helping people find the place. Neither the approval of the Sacramento River TMP or the TUCP order impacted temperatures on Butte Creek or other non-project tributaries where spring run Chinook salmon spawn but conditions on the main stem of Sacramento River likely did affect returning adults. The following sentence was added. While not likely influenced by the TMP or TUCP, temperatures on the main stem Sacramento River at Hood exceeded the EPA Region 10 criteria of 68 degrees Fahrenheit for suitable salmon salmonid migration in May and may have created a temperature barrier that impeded upstream, upstream migration of spring run Chinook salmon after May 1. The following changes have been made to the ordering conditions. I will just read through these and note where the change was made. DWR and Reclamation shall evaluate and identify minimum Delta export thresholds for the purposes of meeting human health and safety and wildlife refuge needs that are consistent with any infrastructure and operational constraints that are clearly defined and supported with evidence and documentation. This evaluation shall include a definition of human health and safety supply, 
describe the recipients and uses of any water exported south of the Delta during the effective period of the changes approved by the June 1, 2021 to UCP order and describe whether DWR and reclamation considered that use to have constituted a health and safety need and quantify human health and safety supply monthly volume and acre feet parenthetical. This evaluation shall be done in coordination with State Water Board staff. A draft report is due to the State Water Board no later than March, which was removed and replaced with April 1, 2022. DWR and Reclamation shall present the draft report at a State Water Board meeting for public and board comments. A final report is due to the State Water Board no later than 30 days after receiving staff and public comments. Do you want to scroll down a little bit? Thanks. Okay, condition three. DWR and reclamation shall identify and implement needed improvements to forecast methods to avoid significant over or underestimates of available water supplies and shall provide updates to the board on these efforts, along with updates on current hydrologic and operational forecasts for the water year on a monthly basis, starting in February is removed with a double strikeout and replaced with March with double underline of 2022 and counting until the drought emergency is over. Monthly hydrologic and operational forecast shall also be submitted in writing and include information on forecasted inflows, reservoir releases, water supply deliveries, reservoir storage levels, any coordinated operation agreement debts, planned water transfers, forbearance agreement actions, exchanges, and other actions of this nature and other relevant information that may be requested by the State Water Board's Executive Director to inform future drought-related decision-making. Condition four, by March is removed with a double strikeout and replaced with April with a double underline, first 2022, DWR and Reclamation shall provide a written accounting in an electronic spreadsheet format of the actual monthly contract deliveries that occurred during water year 2021. The accounting shall include deliveries to the groups of contractors identified in table one of this order. For Feather River agencies and Sacramento River settlement contractors, the accounting shall identify the monthly delivered volume that was made pursuant to state SWP and CVP water rights the monthly delivered volume that was diverted under Feather River agencies and Sacramento River settlement contractors own rights and claims of right, and identification of SWP supply, CVP supply, Sacramento River settlement contract and Feather River agency contract supply that was transferred, exchanged, or part of a forbearance agreement and the groups of users that this water was provided to, and the monthly and total volume of water diverted under all rights and claims by these users and the allocation percentage it represents. Condition five, in coordination with the State Water Board, Central Valley Water Board, and the Interagency Ecological Program, DWR and Reclamation shall complete the special study required by condition eight of the June 1st, 2021 TUCP order on the prevalence and extent of harmful algal blooms and expansion of invasive aquatic weeds in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Consistent with the June 1, 2021 TUCP order, the special study shall identify the effects of the TUCP order, any future TUCP orders and associated actions, including drought barriers on the prevalence and extent of harmful algal blooms and expansion of invasive aquatic weeds in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. DWR and reclamation shall coordinate with local watershed groups to determine if additional data are available that should be incorporated into the analysis and report. The next draft report shall summarize impacts to subregions of the Delta consistent with the localized nature of HABs and aquatic weeds and analyze potential for or presence of disproportionate impacts to vulnerable communities such as low-income communities and communities of color with respect to drinking water quality, contact and non-contact recreation, impacts to cultural resources, and impacts to aesthetics, including odors and the visual character of the Delta waterways where HABs and aquatic weeds are prevalent. A complete draft report shall be submitted to the State Water Board by March is deleted with a double strike through and replaced with April with a double underline 30, 2022. 
A summary of the report shall be made available to the State Water Board staff and, I lost my place, hold on. Okay, and public comment and presented at a public board meeting. In coordination with State Water Board and Central Valley Water Quality Control Board staff, DWR and Reclamation shall review and consider comments from the State Water Board and the public and modify the final report as appropriate based on these comments. A complete final report shall be submitted to the State Water Board 30 days after receipt of public and State Water Board staff comments unless the Deputy Director of the Division of Water Rights grants an extension. I think that's the end of the change sheet. If we could go back to the slides, we're primarily done with them, but I think there's just one left. So next slide. So this is where we have staff available for State Water Board questions and comments and then public comment to follow. Thank you, Ms. Forsman. Uh, I don't have any immediate questions looking to my fellow board colleagues. Okay, we have- uh, Actually, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, real, uh, sorry. Uh, no, no, sorry, in the least, board member, please. <laughs> uh, so, Ms. Forsman, could you just walk me through the change to section 2.6.4? Uh, I was just reading that on the change sheet. I'm just trying to understand. It looks like you kind of reordered some of the description. Could you just kind of explain what the significance of that is? Absolutely, can we pull that back up so I can look at it at the same time? So this first one here, correct board member McGuire, the adding following emergence and removing the strike through. Right. So we did receive comments from, um, well, we received comments in the, on the December 15th draft, as well as the February 4 draft, identifying that, um, Sorry, I'm trying to think back to the exact comment. And Diane, if you do remember, please jump in. But this was just a technical clarification and we were just trying to respond to that comment. So, um, yeah, and we can let Michael Macon chime in as well. I think it was just to provide some clarity that was sought in the Glen Clusa Irrigation District comment letter related to explaining the factors um, affecting um, juveniles. I think part of it is um, due to is to split out the egg emergence. There's an egg emergence occurring during the spring. There is rearing and migration occurring during the spring. So making it clear that um, that the, that there are not juvenile or eggs present during the spring time period. I, I believe is the reason for that change. So it's a, a just a technical clarification of the text. Just um, you know, providing making sure it's clear that we're not implying there is um, egg. A, there are eggs still winter and eggs still present during the um, during the spring time period. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you, board member. Any other uh, questions or comments before we go to our public commenters? Okay, seeing none. I'd like to first call up Shelley Cartwright. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as you know, my name is Shelly Cartwright. I'm the Deputy General Manager of External Affairs for Westlands Water District. Um, and I just wanted to express the district's appreciation for the board's actions uh, and all the state board's hard work last year in protecting water rights and protecting the project water. Uh, given the current hydrology, we appreciate the board and the staff's continued efforts to protect those water rights. Uh, in my comments today, I'd like to highlight just two main points. 
Um, first, the order recognizes or the draft order recognizes that uh, for conditions to be imposed, those conditions need to be supported by findings. Uh, the order also acknowledges that storage and temperature conditions were better under the implementation of the 2021 TUCP and temperature management plan than they would have been without um, the TUCP and the TMP. For example, on page 45, the order states that the projects maintained better water quality and lower salinity in the spring and summer of 2021 than would have exist existed under natural conditions. Uh, there are a number of similar statements in the order or the draft order. Uh, and as mentioned in our written comments submitted um, back in January, uh, that acknowledge or um, the, the draft order acknowledges that despite the historic con historically dry conditions, uh, storage and temperature conditions were ultimately better under the operations with the TUCP and the TMP than they otherwise would have been. Uh, given that and given um, that conditions were in fact better, it's hard to understand why um, the same operations rather than the dry conditions themselves uh, were supported a finding of adverse impacts on the imposition and the imposition of certain conditions included in the order. Um, and then my second comment is just regarding the study on the, um, the harmful, harmful algal blooms and the um, invasive aquatic weeds. Wessons agrees that such a study definitely needs to be conducted, uh, but it seems that a study would be more successful if an agency that's focused on scientific investigations took the lead in conducting the study. Having the study occur outside the TUCP process would allow for a more comprehensive study to occur, uh, would allow for more engagement and a broader set of stakeholders to be engaged in the process. Uh, given DWR and Reclamation's expertise, when compared to the expertise uh, and the mission of an agency, say IEP, which the State Board acknowledges should be involved in this process, um, or you know, compared to the Delta Science Program, it seems more appropriate for one of these other entities who are focused on scientific investigations uh, to take the lead in conducting the special study. But that concludes my comments and I appreciate the board's efforts here and your con consideration of my comments. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cartwright. I appreciate uh, your comments and engagement today. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Rebecca Aykroyd. Yes, good morning. Rebecca Aykroyd for the San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority. I'd like to echo uh, Ms. Cartwright's thanks to the board and appreciation to board staff for the improvements in the notification and public engagement process since the previous TUCP discussions in 2014 to 2016 drought. This process has been substantially better from water user perspective, and we appreciate the challenge that the board and board staff have been striking and have done in striking an appropriate balance between due process and the urgency to act in response to conditions. As stated in our previous written comments, we also appreciate the board's recognition of the need for temporary changes to water right conditions under which the projects operate in times of severe drought and staff's attention to addressing our comments previously submitted on the draft order. We do have concerns about the revised draft order and wish to highlight three points for the board's consideration. First, given the ongoing dry hydrology, notwithstanding the debate over the board's legal authority to add conditions to water rights in response to petitions for consideration, there are policy reasons not to condition the project's 2022 operations and an order on a 2021 TUCP. As was noted earlier, the drought persists and there are likely to be future opportunities to address project operations through existing requirements of Order 90-5 and future TUCPs that are more responsive to conditions in the system today. As a result, we suggest striking conditions associated with 2022 operations from this draft order and denying the petitions for reconsideration in whole. Second, relative to the temperature management plan, section 1C of the draft order states that in evaluating the 2022 TMP, the State Water Board may require additional measures pursuant to its independent authority. We suggest striking this language as it does not provide any additional information regarding the monitoring or reporting necessary to ensure compliance with the very limited terms and conditions in order 90-5. Third and finally, relative to the new requirement that DWR and Reclamation complete a special study on harmful algal blooms or HABs and invasive aquatic weeds in the Delta. 
We are sensitive to the issues impacting Delta communities by HABs and aquatic weeds, and we share their concerns as our members' communities are also impacted. HABs and aquatic vegetation impact facilities that the Water Authority operates and maintains and impact water supply and quality for our members. In particular, HABs have impacted the water quality of San Luis Reservoir on multiple occasions, and the increased growth of aquatic vegetation, particular water hyacinth, has negatively impacted project exports by impairing monitoring efforts at the Tracy Fish Collection Facility. Because of our shared concern over HABs and aquatic vegetation, uh, we agree with Ms. Cartwright's comments and echo that we think the most appropriate place to conduct this work would be with the Delta Science Program, who has highlighted the importance of this issue in multiple management actions within the 2022 to 2026 Science Action Agenda. Housing this work at the science program, rather than with the projects as part of a TUCP order, would more appropriately enable a broader set of stakeholders to engage with the study development and would enable its inclusion as part of a broader science plan for Delta communities um, and also communities relying on the Delta. There is significant value in addressing issues of scientific uncertainty outside of the TUCP process and more broadly analyzing the issue including by analyzing impacts of algal blooms and invasive aquatic weeds on communities' reliance on the Delta and on project operations and facilities in the Delta. That concludes my comments, and I'd like to thank you for your time and your and your staff's attention to these issues. Thank you, Ms. Ackroyd. I appreciate it. Uh, Board Member Firestone. So I just have a follow-up question on the comments on the HABs um, and relation to the um, the Delta Science Program. Is there something in the requirements here that prevents um, that sort of coordination and integration with the Delta Science Program? Um, I, I'm, are you suggesting that we shouldn't include anything here at all and just leave it to the Delta Science Program? Or is there something we can do within this order to help make sure that that coordination and integration with the, the broader Delta Science Program um, is going to occur. You should be She's invited to, yeah, she, she should, <laughs> uh, you should you. be invited, there you are. Yes, um, so going to your question, I, I think the more appropriate thing would be to remove it from this order altogether and do and have it with the, the Delta Science um, Science Program. There's nothing prohibited coordination from occurring, but right now the way that this is putting the onus on the projects to develop the study, it, it kind of forecloses the ability to have it housed in the broader program. So I do think that would be more appropriate to include it outside of this process. Thank you, board member, for the, the good question. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ackroyd. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, next, I believe we have John Eric. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, board members. I apologize for the lighting. I'm not trying to set any mood here. I just don't have good uh, technical help. Um, I have a presentation. I hope they can pull that up. Um, next slide, please. And of course, I'm John Herrick, uh, Council Manager for South Delta Water Agency. Uh, that doesn't mean much. We only have one person, and that's me. But next slide, please. Um, I just want to make some general comments, a, a few specific uh, ones. But generally speaking, this order, like previous ones, I think it fails to provide justification for its conclusions. In, in many cases, or in most cases, the order reviews comments and then reviews the severity of the drought we're in, which is of course is extremely severe, but then it, it simply concludes that because it was a severe drought, the decision by the executive director, our decisions by the executive director are correct. And I, I don't think that goes to the, the, um, the rules and the law which guide these sort of, of, of uh, decisions. Next slide, please. And of course the urgent need under which this is all done is defined in the code, but that urgent need also includes the, the, the uh, quote I have here, and it requires that the petitioner has not exercised due diligence or, or, or make sure that it, petitioner has exercised due diligence in petitioning for a change pursuant to provisions of this division. Next slide, please. Now that is very clear, and that means that rather than waiting until the last minute, a petitioner under a TUCP is supposed to show that 
there's a reason why, or they didn't do under due diligence, try to get these changes under the normal processes, not these truncated short-term processes. And as far as I read the, the draft order here, there isn't any examination of why the Bureau and DWR could not have tried to make changes for uh, extraordinary drought uh, times under the normal processes. Um, as you recall, this all started in 2014 and 15 when the, that drought was ongoing. And it, you know that's been eight years and we haven't had any efforts to make these changes. The reason why that's important is we're using the TUCPs as a method by which to address droughts that occur regularly in California. Well, the drought is not an urgent, urgent un, um, uh, a need. The drought is a regularly occurring thing that we're supposed to plan for. And the Bureau and DWR do not plan for that. Next slide, please. Now, the, the urgent need also requires that the, the circumstances show that the the, the changes are for the benefit of the constitutional policy of water resources state being put to beneficial use. Next, next slide, please. Now, the reason I bring this up is that the, the specifics of the requirements of the Bureau and DWR are not provided in the order. The draft order, of course, cites two reservoir levels and the severe shortages, but it ignores San Luis Reservoir. Well, why is that important? Next slide, please. Well, the policy of the state is already set forth for protecting beneficial uses, whether it's in the Constitution or in the, the, the uh, uh, provisions of the law or in water board permit conditions. And you know that in 2021, the projects exported water based on the assumption there would be participation. They vastly overestimated snowmelt, and yet they exported water. So is the policy of the state to allow exports to maximize what they can do guessing that a drought won't continue and then use that export water for non-beneficial uses in the Delta, which are not being met. Next slide, please. Now I bring this up because, and it, I don't think it ever gets in any of these orders, the permit conditions for San Luis Reservoir require that the Delta provisions water quality objectives be met. And so that means to us that San Luis Reservoir water is or should be available for meeting Delta outflow, San Joaquin River needs, rather than having TUCPs that alter those to the detriment of the beneficial uses. Now, we know that releases from San Luis would be a good thing because this year the Bureau released water from New Malonis that it didn't normally, that hasn't normally done in the past in order to meet Delta outflow. And that extra flow down the river for two months met all the Southern Delta water quality standards, which under normal drought conditions probably not, would have not been met. So San Luis, San Luis Reservoir should have been mentioned and it should have been used because that's the way to put the policies of the state of California into effect. Next slide, please. So the TUCP authorized exports at a time when there was insufficient storage to meet D1641 standards and project permit conditions. Now we've gone through this in the staff presentation a little bit, but some of that export or all of that export was supposed to be for health and safety needs. The draft order has a provision there that talks about, well, the assumption was made that all municipal and industrial uses were health and safety. Next slide, please. But of course that's not true, right? Health and safety needs are some minimum health and safety uh, requirements are not being met if, uh, if all municipal and industrial uh, needs were health and safety, then there wouldn't be exports for anybody else. They would all go to cities. Now, the reason I bring this up is, next slide, please. We have specific provisions that state you can't export water from the Delta unless you do certain things. Now, here's a, uh, the front page of the contract with North Delta Water Agency and DWR, and the highlighted text on the left shows you that DWR recognizes that under California law, salinity control, maintenance of an adequate water supply for reasonable use in the Delta, and it relegates to a lower priority exports for any purpose. Next slide, please. This is a quote from the state uh, US, the State Water Resource Control Board, the, the Racinelli decision, and this reiterates this. Now, this should be the case the, the, the law of the case, because it's all the same parties, all the same topics. And the, the USV State Water Resource Control Board quoted the Delta Act, which says 
The act prohibits project exports from the Delta of water necessary to provide water to which the Delta users are entitled, water which is needed for salinity control and an adequate supply. And it mean, and it says you can't export unless those are met. So if you grant TUCPs that don't provide for Delta outflow or water quality protection in the Delta, you can't allow exports under this provision. Next slide, please. Now, this is sort of my summary here. I have a little bit after this, but the process is just wrong. And, and I think you all know that. The, we just turned the staff report that more studies are being uh, ordered and, and the Bureau and DWR are supposed to do certain actions in order to get more information in order to uh, manage the system during these drought times. That's completely backwards. We don't want to manage the system on a day-to-day -day basis when droughts occur. We wanna have pre-planning so that the Bureau and DWR know what they're going to do and do it, not just throw the, you know, their hands in the air and say, oh my goodness, there's not enough storage. So we have to not meet water quality provisions. That's a very, very important aspect of this. And I think it's being missed in the continuation of this, these TUCPs. All we do is encourage the Bureau and DWR to not plan ahead. Now, inherent in this, what, what I just said, is the fact that I think the board has to come to grips someday with the notion that when you grant a TUCP to decrease a water quality objective for the protection of fish or any others, you then have to make a finding that it doesn't adversely affect fish. <laughs> and so inherent in the decrease in the standard is the reason why you can't grant it, right? I mean, it doesn't fit. Emergency uh, uh, procedures like this are meant for things like, you know, something blows up some valve and they can't release the fresh water. There's a landslide in the water's not flowing. It's unforeseen events. When you turn bad planning into an emergency, then we end up this where we don't have enough water. Everybody fights over it and the rules, the rules aren't even known. So next slide, please. I'll try to wrap up here. Not supposed to harm any legal users. Next slide, please. The, 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 uh, the draft order goes at length to say that, well, since uh, the water supply, excuse me, the water quality maintained in the Delta was better than it would have been historically means that you're not harmed. I don't think anybody thinks that's true. The water quality objectives for agricultural beneficial uses are meant to protect agricultural beneficial uses. You can't say that when you decrease those standards or, or relax them, you can't say there's no, nobody can be harmed by that. You instituted them to protect those people. So it doesn't make any sense. Um, this year, there wasn't any problem in the South Delta during the times that New Malonis water was being released for Delta outflow. And so the South Delta from you know, June and August, excuse me, July and August, we don't have a big complaint really about damage to us. But you can't have these principles that say, if we don't comply with our own rules to protect you, you're not harmed. I mean, you just can't do that logically, much less scientifically. So I do want to stress that point that we now found out this last summer that the Bureau can actually meet the troublesome salinity standard points in the South Delta by releasing water. Now, it doesn't have to be New Malonis water. It can be that San Luis water. And then these standards that the Bureau and DWR told you couldn't be met can be met all the time. So next slide, please. Uh, I'll just I'll just go through the next couple slides. I want you to know that contrary to uh, statements that many people make, the South Delta water quality was better in, historically than it is now. Now that's not always the case in every month because we have releases for fish and other uses. But I want you to know that next slide, you know we did this study with the Bureau in 1980, and the average salinity in the Delta and the San Joaquin River was much less than it than the standard is now. Next slide, please. And in the worst of worst droughts, the, the, the bad water intruded only partially into the South Delta, not all the way. And the rest of the South Delta was getting that good San Joaquin water and everybody irrigated and was happy. Next slide, please. One more. And then there's, we've submitted this before, the Water Severe's report. These are grab samples of water quality during that worst of the drought years before current droughts. And you, if you go down to the ones for South Delta, there's Mossdale and Durham Ferry. The, the samples being taken there are ex excellent quality water. That's during the bottom of the drought. So 
I would hope that staff no longer says things like we're much better off now because the projects are violating the standards than we were historically, because that's not true. So I'll just sum that up. I thank you for your time. Sometimes I get a little animated, so I'm sorry if I've done too much of that. Um, I think the board needs to adopt a new policy henceforth about these TUCPs so we don't keep doing the same thing every year rather than have long-term planning. If we go through a horrible drought year and you get into January and February, I sure as hope the, the projects aren't increasing allocations or expecting there to be some magical storm event that saves us. We need to plan so that we don't all fight each other over the limited water supply when the droughts go on and on and on. If you have another year of drought, you know that these TUCPs have done nothing to help that. With that, I thank you very much. And if you have any questions or if anyone wants to tour the South Delta, all you have to do is call me. Thank you. Really appreciate the good comment, Mr. Eric, um, and uh, your continued leadership, I know, in this space. Um, just really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, we have Dean Ruiz. And uh, Mr. Ruiz, you uh, marked uh, speak if necessary. So um, just let us know if you're, you're wishing to speak. I know, thank you. I don't have any further comments. Uh, Mr. Herrick covered it for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reese. Appreciate it. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Aaron Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair and board members. Good morning. I'm Aaron Evans on behalf of the Santa Clara Valley Water District or Valley Water. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, first, Valley Water recognizes the impact of harmful algal blooms and supports the investigation and use of best available science to improve Delta water quality and minimize the effect on economically disadvantaged and historically marginalized communities. Regarding the new condition five, we're concerned about including algal bloom reporting and analysis as a condition of the temporary urgency change petition. This TUCP is an instrument intended to address the urgent drought-related operational needs of water projects. The specific additional reporting and analysis requirements are simply outside the narrow scope of the TUCP. Harmful algal blooms are a statewide issue and we face them in the San Luis Reservoir and in other water bodies. In the Delta, there are a variety of factors that affect the prevalence of algal blooms beyond state and federal water project operations. Analysis of this issue, we believe, requires a comprehensive and science-based effort. And that effort would be conducted more effectively by the Delta Science Program, as you've heard previously, um, which really is committed to this science-based analysis. They have expertise in hydrology, biology, social sciences, and have the appropriate scope to take a more comprehensive look at both the causes and the solution. Um, again, we believe the Delta Science Program really is a more appropriate place to house this effort, and they're really a natural fit for investigation of harmful algal blooms in the Delta. Thanks for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Really appreciate uh, your comments here. In uh, hearing several comments, uh, obviously, around the harmful algal bloom study requirements. So I'm sure we'll have some discussion here as a board uh, around it. So thank you. Next, I'd like to call up David Guy. Hey, good morning, uh, Chair Escobel, members of the board. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, just uh, want to take a couple of moments and uh, you're obviously looking at an order that uh, reflects on 2021. And I think it's helpful to provide some context and to reflect a little bit on 2021 uh, for your purposes. I think uh, obviously it goes without saying, but uh, 2021 was the driest, hottest year that anybody can remember. Um, and yet, uh, despite uh, that, at least in the uh, area that uh, we, I work in the uh, Sacramento Valley, um, we were able to work through the year. And that only happened because of collaboration, because of hard work. There were a lot of acres that were left idled in the region. There were communities that uh, were challenged. Uh, there were fish and wildlife that were challenged, and yet in all of those instances, folks really rolled up their sleeves, worked together, and collaborated to make all of those uh, beneficial purposes uh, work in 2021. And I think everything, uh, although it, everything suffered, I think everything uh, made it through the year. And in fact, I think we had some really good success stories that I think should be uh, reflected here. So I think as we look to 2021, I guess 
Uh, the first thing I would encourage is one, I think I would hope the state water board would applaud uh, the operators of the project. I would hope they would applaud the fishery agencies. I would hope they would applaud uh, the conservation organizations that rolled up their sleeves and went to work. Um, people got through the year and that was only because people were working really hard out on the ground uh, to make that uh, work. And in fact, I think as a result of that, I think every uh, beneficial purpose was essentially addressed, uh, you know, much as your charge uh, under law is, is called for. Um, as we look to the next year, uh, boy, I would encourage you to provide as much flexibility for project operators as you can. Um, I think that's what we've seen every year is different. Um, and I think uh, tying uh, operators hands is in my view, not been ever very helpful. I think uh, having regular updates reports, but giving the operators flexibility, I think is really uh, valuable. And I think uh, it allows people to work together. I think things like the meet and confer process, I think uh, have worked really well and having the water board part of that process, I think was really helpful. And so I think that's the kind of the model that we think of uh, looking forward. So I think I would just sum up, it's not clear to us why uh, you would pose additional conditions on uh, the project after last year. I thought uh, the uh, year uh, worked uh, fairly well. Again, considering it was the driest, hottest year anybody has seen, um, everything made it through the year, um, you know, even with some pain. And so uh, just to encourage you to kind of think about that. And instead of, uh, you know, uh, tying, I think the operator's hands, we would encourage you to really applaud them and help empower them as we uh, go forward in 2022. Uh, we know what the reservoir situation is like, particularly on the west side of the Sacramento Valley. It's going to be a rough year. There's going to be a lot of economic and environmental pain um, as we sit here today. And I think giving the operators as much flexibility, I think would be really helpful going forward. So thank you for the opportunity to, to share some perspective. Really appreciate that, Mr. Guy. Uh, you know, a quick question, really wanting to understand uh, which provisions do you feel particularly are tying the project operator's hands? Well, I think one uh, kind of example of that is I think the, uh, the reference to the uh, interim operations plan um, I think that was a, you know, kind of a unilateral provision uh, that did not involve collaboration. Um, and I think as uh, we sit here today, um, you know, nobody could operate to that plan in 2022. Um, we're hoping that will change, obviously, with, with new hydrology uh, in the next month or two. But I think that's the kind of thing that I, I think would, uh, would be better off uh, providing some flexibility for folks as we go forward. There, to be clear, uh, there's a court proceeding where an interim operation plan is being discussed between the project operators and, um, I believe on our side here, the Natural Resources Agency, uh, Secretary Crowfoot, Secretary Blumenfeld, uh, represented by the Cal EPA. Um, we're deferring that, importantly, to that those decisions in the court. I guess, is the request to ignore what the proceedings happened in the court are around the interim operations plan, or... Well, I think the suggestion, no, I'm not to ignore anything in the legal proceeding, obviously. I think just looking forward, you know, folks have to be able to operate the system. And I think they have to do it in a very practical way with whatever the reservoir storage looks like. And uh, that's what I think we're suggesting. And I think having uh, you providing the uh, operators with as much flexibility to do that, um, I think would be welcome. And again, I think 2021 was a good example of, I think they did a great job and I hope you would applaud them for that and encourage them to do the same in 2022, working with all the different uh, parties that wanna help that succeed. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Uh, I think we preserve a lot of that flexibility in what we're considering here. I appreciate, I think some, some specificity there. And what I would say is um, we shouldn't take this action by the board trying to improve our decision-making coming into the next year by reflecting on how we could improve it from the last year as um, somehow not applauding the projects and uh, given an either or. Um, here, I think that we can all engage on this project, I hope, not seeing it as um, a negative or somehow the board trying to pick on the projects, but I think all within our decision-making, trying to make uh, improvements to it, knowing uh, that we didn't get everything right last year. Um, and yes, there are um, a lot of bright spots around the increased collaboration and coordination. We spoke about this here early in the board meeting and some of the other watersheds that we're working in. So um, appreciate the points though, in uh, your time and engagement. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Dante John Namalini.
Mr. Nomalini, you, you'll want to try to unmute again. Can you hear me now? We can. Good morning. All right. Well, I think it's important uh, that the board and staff uh, maintain their position of independence from the proceedings of the court. Of course, the court is dealing with the Endangered Species Act and the obligations associated with the biological opinions. Uh, that court proceeding uh, should not be allowed to flow over into how the state board and how all of the rest of us affected by state board actions react to the transfer of water, the export of water from the Delta, and so on and so forth. So a temporary management plan, of course, is a part of that. But what you do to meet the temporary management plan has impacts that go beyond uh, just the biological opinion. Now, you've heard the water contractor people talk about uh, better than natural conditions. Of course, the projects have affirmative obligations to provide salinity control, uh, mitigate their impact, adverse impacts on other aspects besides what was naturally the condition in the without project condition. And the courts have made it clear that the water quality standards, of course, reflect a board decision uh, based on many factors, but it cannot be limited to the without project condition. And the conditions that exist today, I think, require the board to ask the question of the project operators when they say they can increase exports from the Delta is simply to ask the question, how will that affect or will it adversely affect your ability to meet the water quality standards in the upcoming year, the current year and years thereafter? That's the question that needs to be decided because what you export today, what you exported yesterday and what you're gonna export during the year all impact your ability to meet the standards in a subsequent year. And the problem that we have is that planning has not gone on. I suspect it's, it's due to the fact that the projects have not developed the water that was planned, the, the excess surplus water that was planned to meet the needs of the projects and the needs in the areas of origin. That I think has to be acknowledged that they have that inability to carry out the meeting of the standards we ought to make it clear to everyone involved so that proper actions could be taken rather than just shift the burden from the export area onto those within the watershed. Now, there are a number of things with regard to health and safety that I think can be improved. I think the needs in the valley, in the export service area, can be met by projects in that area. For example, you've got Friant Dam. Uh, it's operated by the Bureau. The Bureau, we know, has contributed significantly to add salinity to the San Joaquin River, which impacts the ability to meet water quality standards in the Delta. Those health and safety needs should first be met with water from that source. The exchange contractors, if there's no water from Northern California, they're entitled to take water from the San Joaquin River. Taking water from the San Joaquin River rather than from the Delta will improve the ability to meet the standards up in the North. So without belaboring the point, I think the board ought to stay involved. I think we ought to have more public access to what is happening with regard to the operation plan. I would ask that the board not become tied in and committed uh, to the court proceeding, which is not a public proceeding and it's limited. Even though EPA may be involved, I don't think the board uh, should give up its independence to act. You have adjudicatory authority given to you. It's very important that we maintain due process uh, and not get bound into some backroom deal associated with litigation. Thank you very much. And I appreciate uh, staff recognition of some of these sensitive issues and I hope the board uh, we'll continue to recognize it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Navalini. Appreciate your comments. Uh, next, I would like to call up Brett Baker. 
Thank you, Chair Esquivel. I, uh, <clears throat> I'll keep this short. I just wanted to uh, note that we submitted a PowerPoint presentation uh, for Mr. Nomalini's speaking and uh, just I, I'll, I'll save everybody from reading those into the record, but if, if they get, if staff could get a chance and if, if the, you board members could get a chance to take a look at those, we put some thought and time into, into putting in, uh, together those requests. And I would just like to take this time to applaud you um, for taking um, an independent stance, uh, particularly, um, I really feel like this is an opportunity for the board to, to um, act independently. And, and it's not an easy job that you have. You're not um, uh, an observer. Your, your job is not to applaud. Your, your job is to uh, make decisions and they're tough decisions. And so I applaud you for, for stepping up and I hope that you, um, you know, uh, show in the in the coming months, the board show in the coming months, their independence and in considering uh, not only this TUCP, but the multitude of transfers that I assume will be proposed and are being proposed uh, to the board. And yes, um, number two in, in our slide, our, our PowerPoint presentation um, is, I think for me uh, personally, um, something as I've watched transfers be uh, temporarily done um, that, that, that you not allow those unless water quality standards are met uh, in the current year without the TUCP. And um, I, 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 I'll hearken back to Mr. Herrick's comment that it evades logic and I believe the law to say that you can deviate from such standards without causing harm to water users or fish and wildlife uh, or the public trust. Additional requirements uh, uh, that, that are not being considered in that, in that courtroom uh, where that, that um, interim operations plan was, was developed. So thank you very much and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, I know Ms. Townsend put up here, at least uh, I think the, the first page here of uh, the request and we'll definitely um, review them. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Adam Nichols. Good morning, Mr. Nichols. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, sorry, uh, it's having some technical difficulties. Oh, no, um, I'm Adam Nichols, uh, Re Regional Resources Manager with the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Bureau of Reclamation, provide our oral comments regarding the reconsideration of the temporary urgency change order for the State Water Project and Central Valley Project Water Operations in Water Year 2021. Reclamation would first like to acknowledge uh, DWR's written response to comments provided to the board on February 10th and note our complete agreement with those comments. Additionally, uh, Reclamation would further like to provide the following comments uh, for the record. Related to condition number one, Reclamation previously submitted comments on the initial draft reconsideration in January, noting that a May 1 submittal for a Shasta temperature management plan would represent only April 1 hydrology and corresponding operations outlook, whereas a May 20 submittal would be based on uh, updated May 1st information. The analysis for the final TMP based on April 1st forecast would only include conditions seen through March and would not account for the final water year type, which is determined by the May forecast and has system-wide implications. In addition, it would require analysis to be completed by mid-April, potentially before stratification of the lake has begun and well before it is complete. An earlier TMP submittal means greater likelihood of the project needing to deviate from adjust, uh, or adjust the plan later in the season. We again request the board to reconsider our request to provide a TMP on May 20th. Pertaining to condition number four, we would like to continue to remind the board that our settlement contracts were entered into at the request of the board to settle disagreements regarding settlement contractors' underlying water rights. As a result, we are able to report on water made available under basin project supply as defined by the contract, but we do not track nor have the authority or ability to report on monthly deliveries under the Sacramento River Settlement Contractor's own water rights. Further, similar to DWR's comments on condition four, uh, the changed language for, uh, from to to buy appears to suggest that reclamation would need to uh, account for all water diverted by the water users who received water via transfer. Similar to DWR, reclamation does not account for the entire balance of every recipient's water portfolio. If this is a requirement that the board would like to pursue, 
This information would be best collected by the water users under the drought water use reporting requirements. Lastly, pertaining to condition number five in the board's workshop on algal blooms in the Delta uh, on January 5th, 2022, 2022, the presentation provided to the board was unable to establish a link between the temporary urgency change order and our operations under that order and toxic algal blooms in the Delta. Reclamation and DWR continue to investigate as to the effect of our collective operations have on the influence of toxic algal blooms. As DWR points out uh, in their comment letter, a final report date of April 30th, 2022 will not provide sufficient time to complete the existing work on the draft report. In consultation with our colleagues at DWR, the final analysis for the report is not expected until June 1, 2022 at the earliest and perhaps longer given the apparent expansion of the scope to include analysis potential impacts on vulnerable communities. Given the importance of this issue, we respectfully request that the final report be made to the board no sooner than July 1, 2022. Again, thank you for your time and we look forward to continue to work with the state board on, on many of our collective issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. I appreciate your, your good comment. And, you know, um, I'll just note when it comes to the temperature management plan uh, date and when the board is, is looking to receive it, um, what we're really trying to do, and I, I think folks know this, is continue to move that discussion earlier on in the water year. Um, June, essentially, at that point is, is really late um, to be able to understand how we're best going to manage temperature, temperature. And already at that point, a number of assumptions have been made uh, in, in reclamation's management of things. So I appreciate um, that request. I just wanted to, to sort of show, uh, give a little more discussion as to why we're looking to, to see that moved up a bit. And I understand there are challenges, certainly with the stratification of Shasta and, and not knowing completely where uh, the cold water pool will sit and what that means then for, for the management of it in, through the summer. But um, there must be some modeling tools or predictive capabilities that help us um, at least try to infer what that range might be. And here even, you know, as we say, um, have a temperature management plan in early May that may be reflective of not the, the most uh, up-to-date uh, data on, and hydrology because it takes some time, I imagine, to process that and put it into um, here then action in a plan. You know, I think here we're, we're not being, un, uh, looking to be unreasonable and sort of then yes, uh, changes that may occur and what that updated um, uh, you know, modeling may show. And I think it reflects also a good discussion that we continue to have. And I appreciate the leadership of the projects here around continuing to get better at modeling and understanding um, our, our, uh, our ability to uh, plan for what, you know, Mother Nature doesn't provide with much certainty here. So, and doing that sooner. Um, although again, uh, we're, we're limited by the resources we have. So I um, appreciate that and wanted to make a comment around that. Um, and then here, I, again, I do want to make sure I'm giving, uh, we'll have further discussion, I'm sure, on the helpful, harmful algal bloom report. Um, and uh, when it comes to the ability to um, parse out um, your deliveries by underlying right and or, you know, the rights there of, of uh, the diverters, um, definitely uh, not just an exercise with the projects there, but a continuum to your point of our work on just curtailment and engagement with water rights holders who um, often are the ones themselves who, who best have that data. So I appreciate um, your note there. Uh, I'll go to a couple of board members who had hands up and I wanted to note DWR, we have uh, Jacob McQuirk here, I believe, and apologies, I don't believe you had shown up here on our, our list of uh, commenters. So we'll have you uh, go here uh, then next uh, after Mr. Nichols. And again, appreciate both of you and your engagement here and being with us. Uh, I had a couple hands, uh, one of them went down and so I'll go with the vice chair first and board member McGuire, if uh, you wanna make comment, uh, please do after. Thank you. So um, this is a really good discussion and um, I, I just want to jump in here um, to give some maybe initial thoughts and hopefully we can, um, as we close out, um, hone in on these points a little bit more. But what strikes me is that um, on, in, a couple, in several areas here, um, it seems that we're going to need, we're going to need to have some ongoing dialogue 
and process so that we can uh, better clarify expectations. So just taking the date for temperature management. Um, I understand uh, the Bureau's comments that, you know, later, you know, if you have an assignment like this, you want to be able to produce the best report. And um, having it later in the season does allow, you know, with uh, more accurate uh, information to be able to improve on the report. So I am open to making adjustments on dates, but I don't know that we collectively as a board would want to do that, you know, that everyone would agree with that perspective. And so in the event that we keep this date, you know, just looking for what is the expectation in that report and the ongoing dialogue so that the updated report can um, provide the information that the Bureau feels is more accurate and more helpful. So just trying to, you know, measure our expectations. And the same thing on the accounting for the settlement contractors. I believe one of the letters um, by, I'm not remembering which agency, but indicated, you know, board, this is, you're just going to be repackaging information you already have. And then we hear the Bureau saying, we don't have that information. And so it, it, it just seems that we might be, it, folks might be talking past each other a little bit. So what can we do to better define um, either um, at this point in the order, or do we want to be open to just you know, directing our staff to continue to have dialogue with all the parties so that when we get whatever that information is, it, it is something that is being responsive to our request. So just, you know, um, flagging those two areas and hopefully we can have further dialogue, you know, after all the commenters. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you for the good comment. Board Member McGuire, did you wish to go? Yeah, my, my only comment actually at that time, I actually agree with the vice chair's got good comments there and look forward to talking about that a bit more. I had only wanted to flag that Mr. Nichols had mentioned a, a comment letter from DWR, uh, a written comment letter, which I do not believe we have. And so I appreciate seeing Mr. McClurk from DWR and hope he can address that specifically if he could. Thank you, board member. That's it. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Nichols, uh, truly. And uh, then we can go to Mr. McQuirk. Thank you for joining us here today. Sorry, one moment, you should be invited to unmute. Okay, you should be unmuted now. Unmute. Perfect. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can everybody? I, I assume everybody can hear me. So um, thank you, uh, Chairman and board members. So the reason I've, I've come to this meeting is because it appears that our comment letter uh, was not sent out as it was. So I'd like to take this opportunity to go ahead and read these comments into the record. Um, and then, I mean, if it, if it would help, I could also share my screen that also has the letter on it as I read it. Um, uh, what I believe we have everyone locked down here. Uh, and what you may okay. be able to do, though, is, uh, but please do email um, our clerk of the board, Janine Townsend, here um, uh, okay. the, the document, and we can get it up on the screen. Um, I can do that. Chair Esquivel, I do have the letter here if you want us to. Oh, great. Well, good. If you already have it in your possession, then if you don't mind, uh, please putting it up. Thank you. Sure. Just give us a few minutes. Um, Mr. Perfect. McCork, did you want us to? To show the letter, apparently there's a summary as well. Um, the, the letter, the letter is fine, please. Okay, all right, we'll and go ahead and pull it up. Just give us a. Thank few you seconds. very much. Yeah, and right, so thank you. Uh, being that there is a quite there's there's a bit to the letter, so I'll go ahead and and, and I will get started. So, um, so first the first comment that we have is with regards to condition five. Uh, the order contains. Um, okay, great. Uh, the order contains a new section, section two point eight on harmful. Uh, aquatic blooms and aquatic weeds. And within its uh, staff summarized public comments on the occurrence and impacts from harmful algae blooms or HABs. As this section noted, DWR is gathering and analyzing HABs data related to the installation of the emergency drought barrier. HABs are an ongoing concern in the Delta, particularly during dry and drought conditions, when temperatures are above average and natural flows are low. The impacts to communities in the Delta, especially vulnerable communities are important to recognize. DWR has engaged in a longstanding effort to investigate and understand HABs and the importance 
upon the Delta. During operations permitted under the 2021 TUCP order, DWR was releasing supplemental water into the Delta. Those releases and drought barriers were part of a comprehensive set of actions taken by the state water project to address the many challenges of the drought. DWR will continue to focus on how it can remain um, an active partner with other state and local agencies to address these challenging circumstances. In reviewing the context of condition five, DWR believes that the added text is important, but properly the task of a multi-agency effort to tackle such a critical assessment. DWR suggests a joint agency work effort between state water board and DWR in coordination with local agencies and tribes would be better suited in developing a vulnerable communities assessment. A joint effort along those lines would help facilitate an inclusive public process with staff who are more specifically trained on drinking water quality, contact and non-contact recreation, impacts to tribal cultural resources and impacts to aesthetics, including odor and the visual character of the Delta waterways. The more focused report required by condition eight of the June 1, 2021 TUCP order can be finalized prior to that process and help inform the vulnerable assessments community. With respect to the new broad scope of condition five, the very short time frame should be adjusted to recognize the broad and important nature of the task at hand. Condition five of the new order states, in coordination with the State Water Board, Central Valley Water Board, and the Interagency Ecological Program, DWR and Reclamation shall complete the special study required by Condition 8 of the June 1, 2021 TUCP order on the prevalence and extent of harmful algal blooms and the expansion of invasive aquatic weeds in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. Consistent with June 1, 2021 TUCP order, the special study shall identify the effects of the TUCP order, any future TUCP orders, and any associated actions, including drought barriers on the prevalence and extent of harmful algal blooms and expansion of invasive weeds in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. DWR and Reclamation shall coordinate with local watershed groups to determine if any additional data are available that should be incorporated into the analysis and report. The next draft report shall summarize impacts to subregions of the Delta consistent with the localized nature of HABs and aquatic weeds and analyze potential for of presence of disproportionate impacts to vulnerable communities such as low-income communities and communities of color with respects to drinking water quality, contact and non-contact recreation, impacts to tribal cultural resources, and impacts to aesthetics, including odor and visual character of Delta waterways where HABs and aquatic weeds are prevalent. A complete draft of the report shall be submitted to the state board by March 31st, 2022. A summary of the report shall be made available for state water board staff and public comment and presented at a public board meeting in coordination with state water board and Central Valley Water Quality Control Board staff, DWR and Reclamation shall review and consider comments from the state water board and the public and modify the the final report as appropriate based on these comments. A complete final report shall be submitted to the state water board 30 days after the receipt of public and state water board staff comments, unless the deputy director for the Division of Water Rights grants an extension. Emphasis added. This new condition represents a recognition of the board and important nature of the problem. As a result, however, the commensurate expansion of scope compared to the report required by the June 1st, 2021 TUCP order requires coordination with local watershed groups, including consulting with tribes in order to ascertain what constitutes an appropriate subregion of the Delta and analyzing data based upon those delineations, defining the impacts to the vulnerable communities and expanding the assessment to impacts upon subjective qualities such as aesthetics and visual character. Achieving this degree of community outreach and scope of work 
importantly alters the task originally included in the June 1st, 2021 TUCP order, but cannot be completed on the timeframe within the condition. DWR believes that rescoping, conducting a robust public process and rewriting the prior report will require substantial time beyond the seven months granted in the June 1st, 2021 TUCP order. Furthermore, requiring a final report by March 31st, 2022 will not allow sufficient time to complete existing work on the draft report. Hyperspectral hyper imagery collected in 2021 will not be fully analyzed until April. This data is critical for assessing the areas of aquatic weeds in the Delta. Without this data, we cannot analyze whether weeds increase in coverage or density during, the 20, during 2021 and cannot assess whether the 2021 TUCP and the West Falls River barrier impacted the spread of weeds. Similarly, the full data shows full data set showing phytoplankton community composition collected by the Environmental Monitoring Program was only made available in January, and data integration efforts must be completed before it can be analyzed. Even had the scope of the condition not expanded, DWR believes that it needs until June 1st, 2022 to perform complete analysis. As a final note, this condition allows for only 30 days after receipt of public and state water board staff comments, which considering the sensitivity of this topic are likely to be substantial regardless of the content of the report. Meaningful coordination with the state water board and Central Valley Water Quality Control Board should be given 90 days. On condition four, the final sentence of condition four was modified to read and the monthly and total volume, can we scroll up please? of water diverted under all rights and claimed by these users to be the allocation percentage that it represents. While small, this shift in language from to, from, from to to by meaningfully alters the requirement in a way that moves it well beyond what data DWR has readily available to it. The language in the December 15th, 2021 draft TUCO would have required DWR to provide an accounting of how much and what allocation of Feather River Agency contract water was diverted to water users under agreements for transfers exchange or forbearance of water, which would consist of information DWR can provide from FWP records it maintained. This revised language, however, would direct DWR to account for all water diverted by water users who are party to the agreements, which may be broader than Feather River Agency or other SWP contract supply and moves well beyond the data DWR has readily available to it. If it is the State Water Board staff's intent to collect information regarding these broader rights and claims of rights, this is properly a question directed at those water users under the drought water use reporting requirements. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to cooperatively work with the State Water Board and its staff during this challenging period to manage water resources for the benefit of the people and natural resources of the state of California. Thank you very much for this opportunity to read these comments into the record. Thank you, Mr. McCork. Uh, really appreciate you reading them in and the engagement here. Um, Looking to fellow board colleagues, if there's any questions, uh, seeing as how you know we are fresh on this here, but uh, appreciate the the two uh, conditions here that are being flagged. Uh, we'll definitely have more discussion here on the harmful algal bloom, bloom condition, I'm sure, and uh, certainly on the issue here of um, the the change uh, from two to buy and what it means on DWR and reclamation's ability to produce the data we're looking for. Um, looking to board members, oh, yeah. Well, means uh, I just, um, it's hard to, obviously we're just reading this on the screen for the first time. So I'm trying to, is there, I guess a request that we could get a copy um, and I would like to just be able to look at it as, you know, as we're considering this. Um, yeah, Ms. And Thompson then, should send that uh, around okay. here shortly. Board, Fires, I, board member Firestone, I actually just sent it to all you board members. Okay, great. I'll check email. Um, and then could you just scroll up? I mean, while we have you <laughs> up here um, to the, on the Habs um, portion, I know there's a lot there. Um, I just wanted to 
follow a little bit. Um, um, okay. Yeah. I, um, so, um, what we are, um, I, I, just to make sure I'm following some of the details here, what we're requiring, I think we changed the March 31st date um, to April um, in the change sheet, but um, that we are, we're, what we're requ requesting there is really um, a draft report. And is that different than what we were originally requesting um, for uh, the um, prior requirements around the report? Was it a draft? I guess maybe this is for staff just to clarify since I don't have everything up um, clearly in front of me to follow this. So can we just clarify the study that we originally requested on this, the um, due date for that, um, I understand, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, changes to the scope here, but um, the original report was a, a draft that was due and what was that date, um, just so I can understand the, the changes on the requirements in terms of uh, what the, was it a draft or final and was it um, what those previous dates were? I think I can answer that question for you and I'm pulling up the, the, two, uh, the 2021 order just to make sure my memory is serving me, but I'll go by memory before I have it pulled up. We required the HABS report to be submitted on December 15th and it wasn't a draft, it was a final. But again, hold on. Thanks for your patience. I'm pulling it up. Um, and we made the change in this condition to add more public process to it based on comments we received in the January 5th public meeting and um, created the draft version being due so that it could be discussed at a water board meeting. Right. Okay. Um, okay, hold on. I have final June order and I'm bringing it up. It's condition eight and I believe it is December 15th. Yes, it was due December 15th, 2021. And we didn't have a draft at that time. So two changes, we would have a draft, well, three changes of, of public comment and you know public participation portion, and then adding additional requirements to summarize and, and the draft report we have does summarize already by subregions, but to continue a focus on subregions since it is such a localized issue, but also to incorporate some of the comments that we heard from the public with respect to communities, um, low income communities and disproportionately impacted communities in the Delta area. And did we receive the final report in December or I know we got a presentation in January just Yes, we received, we received a report in December and um, also then uh, DWR presented on that uh, for us in, in the January 5th, I believe, workshop. And they have more information to pull into the report based on aquatic weeds. And they are also working to coordinate with other deliverables that they have with respect to other permit requirements like the ITP. Um, but they did want to pull in more information from the aquatic weed side. And I think they still had some more HABs information to process, though I'm, I'm not certain on that. Okay, so just um, maybe just to um, DWR, um, thanks for being here. Um, that, so is the, I, I understand the comments on the, um, the, process the time for process um and with the kind of expanded um and more specific scope that we've included here i wasn't and maybe you could scroll down i wasn't following our it sounds like that regardless of that um scope specification um that there's concern around a timeline that 
needing until Jan uh, June or I don't know. I sorry, I don't I can't see the document in front of me. But can you just um, clarify yeah. what the request or kind of point is around um, finalizing a report, um, regardless of the scope change that that's included in this comment letter? Just so I'm following. Yes, I can. I can try to address that, um, Board Member Firestone. So, um, one of the things that I that I am familiar with is uh, some of this analysis does require the receipt of a lot of data. And so, one of the things that I'm familiar with would be hyperspectral imaging. And so, this is uh, remote sensing images that we would have to actually use and be able to have that data process to pull into our analysis. Um, another important factor is we are also working with um, U.S. Geological Survey as well on some of our, our HAB work. And so we're also working to um, get USGS under contract under a new work order as well. So my understanding is on the technical front, we do need more time just because of the fact that these analysis take time and there's a whole you know, a process with receiving the data and analyzing it. Um, as well as working with our experts at USGS. Um, and then I know on the, um, the analysis for uh, disadvantaged communities, I know that we, we really were looking to you know, work with board staff and really help better re, uh, define what exactly we need to do to, to help on that, that requirement as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, just the hyperspectral imagery um, that's something that you wanted to incorporate to update the original report that was, um, or update or supplement the original report that was filed in December? That is my understanding, okay. yes. Great, I, I know we're gonna talk more about this, but thanks for taking that time to help, no me problem. Clarify, help clarify. Yeah, thank you both. Anything further from colleagues and Mr. Lawfer, uh, anything to add? I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarity here um, because obviously uh, the DWR letter had not been circulated in advance and it is being uh, marked as a late comment. However, we do have a practice, especially for short comment letters like this. If somebody is late, they can read it in the record. And obviously uh, Mr. Quirk has had a chance to do that. And the clarity of providing the written to the board members, even as stamped late, is that you all are able to track the language in terms of a red line format. This is an evidentiary submission on their part. So I just wanted to provide that because it may be unclear to some of the folks who are following along. Thank you, Mr. Lawfer. Appreciate it. Anything further for Mr. McQuirk? Okay. Thank you. Really do appreciate the good engagement and comment here. And just thank you. I know uh, it was you. a difficult year and uh, preparing for um, a lot of intense discussion as we have to go through this year. So appreciate the incredible partnership. Thank you. Next, uh, I'd like to call up uh, Thad Bentner. Good morning. You should be invited to unmute here momentarily. I am. Good morning, Chair Esquivel. Uh, board members, thanks for the opportunity to chat with you. Hopefully it's still this morning and I'll try and keep it this morning. How's that? Um, first, I just want to uh, just uh, thank you and appreciate the ability to comment um, on the order. We provided two uh, comment letters. I, I hope you had the opportunity to, to read the comments that we provided. Um, I don't really want to go through those in detail, but maybe just touch on a few highlights and then just close with comments about just our commitment for this year, as, as you pointed out, Chair Esquivel. So first, I, we did provide just some some big global comments, you know, regarding the need to really understand in the document in order really what was within reclamation's control and what wasn't. I think the order quite doesn't get to those issues. Specifically, we raised issues around the coordinated operations agreement, uh, the, the, the timeliness of curtailments, which we saw in 14 and 15 made a big difference in terms of how water was ultimately released uh, from Shasta. So there were just some issues there that, you know, we, we believe that weren't in reclamations control. And I think having some better documentation in the order on that, I think would be helpful and illustrative to you as the board members and the public. Um, and I think that kind of leads into the second kind of global comment is really the need for a, a water balance. I know internally, you know, we as a district, we do a water balance. We see how much water we divert in, how it was used, you know, what was used beneficially, what went to groundwater recharge, uh, went to what went to MIs, et cetera. I mean, and I think having a, a water balance of just how the system operated 
last year, and I believe that's a condition actually for this year, would be important and just really understand really what happened last year, again, to better inform our um, decisions going forward. So I think those are just some big global comments we think are, are you know, be helpful to the order. And I think potentially even delaying action in order to include that information, I think would be appropriate. Um, we did provide some specific comments. Um, I apologize that I did have to step out for part of the meeting. I understand some of those comments were addressed or potentially addressed. I think we still have some concern in how, how they were addressed and potentially would wanna look at those as well and work with your staff about trying to get some, to some better language. Um, I think lastly, just, we kind of closed our, our last letter just with trying to set some expectations. You know, last year, I know, I know there was a lot of focus on temperature dependent mortality and I don't want you all to dive into to fish numbers and everything, but you know, we did work with National Marine Fishery Service on a brood year report for winter run. That was a 2019 report we attached to our letter. Um, we're actually looking at funding those same reports for 2020 and 2021. Um, where we believe that's really an exhaustive and conclusive document that provides a lot of good context on species monitoring and everything. And it's kind of showed out the report really based on the number of adults that came up. The egg to survival actually was expected to be low to begin with. I mean, at best, it was probably in the 15 to 17% range. So as we did have a low survival this past year, obviously that's not, you know, a number out of 100 percent it really was out of more what was likely and that, again, that was closer to 15 to 17 percent um, we understand again that you're likely going to have a, a workshop on the status of the species next month and uh, we definitely want to be able to provide some of this information in, in context going forward and i think lastly you know we hopefully we're not you don't see our comments as being critical of the border staff we really want to work cooperatively and, and i think just committing to you for this coming year um, like I said, Charisco, it's, it's going to be a challenging year. Um, we've already been briefing our landowners about how bad it could be. Um, and when you tell some of your landowners you may not get any water, which is the first time in history, it's, it's, it's a rough conversation. Um, so I just want to let you know that we are trying to start to manage expectations. We're, we're committed to working with you on uh, joint and public modeling. I think uh, uh, Vice Chair Diorama asked a question about modeling, and I think we're committed to making sure we have those tools available, that they're public. Um, we're working with your staff right now on water rights, reporting, real-time diversion data. Again, better ways to provide an update of how the system is operating in real time. Uh, like last year, we're committed to voluntary action. So uh, we, again, we're, we wanna have those opportunities to sit down and, and commit to working on those things for this coming year. Um, I would just say, as we kind of continue to drag you know the train from last year it is a little challenging i think it starts to potentially undermine trust a little bit so you know to the extent we can kind of agree on how last year went uh, put the document um, in a safe space and, and really look forward would be ideal from our, our position so again thank you for the opportunity to comment um, and look forward to working with you all uh, these next couple of months as we face a challenging spring and summer Thank you, Mr. Bettner. I appreciate your, your good leadership. I know on what are a lot of complicated um, circumstances at the local level for uh, the sector and for communities throughout. So um, appreciate uh, the, the engagement and do know um, any comments here are never taken personally at all. Uh, the, you know, the, the subject matter is too, um, too important to make it about us. And so um, do appreciate the flags and even the disagreements which there are many abound and we can honestly have and engage. I think the common core here is we are trying to just have greater transparency into what is a very complex system across, you know, both the Delta up and through the watersheds and, you know, using our uh, proper authorities on water rights here in this decision around TUCPs and how we, we help engage uh, the projects and, and create the trust, as you said, that we really need. And so know that, um, we, we share we share a lot of that in common and really do appreciate the good uh, leadership on on what is going to be a complex year. Uh, Vice Chair. Thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Bettner, and your leadership. Um, and I, I'm just going to take this as an opportunity uh, because I know you've really dedicated a lot of personal time um, to modeling and um, pulling together broad uh, range of stakeholders on the science partnership, and then also the other processes on temperature management. And just really looking for um, your uh, suggestion as to how can we um, 
go, go forward with a determination today. And then also where that fits in with the temperature um, or not temperature, but um, you know, broadly, um, yeah, a temperature workshop coming up and focusing a bit more on fisheries and trying to uh, just get to a place where we can be further enlightened on, you know, the broad uh, context of these temperature issues and mortality and, you know, from a, a non-scientific uh, uh, perspective here, how to help us hone in on what really matters, not just from your perspective, but kind of collectively the broad group that's working on these temperature issues, because it's just, uh, I, I have this ongoing frustration um, on these issues, trying to tease out, you know, any statistic that comes out and figure out, um, you know, is this kind of the combat science, one report versus another, or is this an area that we are, you know, maybe overly focused on, I know NACWA's letter kind of called out, you know, being overly focused on certain aspects of um, temperature dependent mortality and not looking at other factors. And, you know, just really wanting to get beyond um, kind of the talking points on this and where we, any suggestions you might have for us on how we could better structure the discussion so that we could start to um, uh, narrow down on, you know, a, a um, more enlightening discussion so that we can move forward on this topic? Well, I mean, I, I would just say to the extent that there's a way to, you know, either have one or two board members, you know, if we are talking about, if you're focusing on a workshop for next month, for example, I mean, if, if there was a way to work with potential, you know, the, the, the different groups that may want to present or whatever, that you have those questions ready. And, and, and I think, you know, I think one, we don't want to be doing a disservice to you all. You're all doing a lot of work. You're not just focused on our region or fisheries or winter run. You have a lot of things that you're trying to balance. So how do we provide you the right information without getting too into the weeds or in, into the details? I, I do have a concern either whether it's in this venue, um, you know, whether it's the legal venue or, or the reconsultation about what are the metrics? You know, what are we trying to achieve and, and how do we get there? And do we have the monitoring really set up to do that? So I, I think we welcome those questions. I don't know if we're gonna have all the answers for you, um, but I, I think, you know, we can start to do that. I think we are certainly committed to working with your staff, the fish agencies to make sure we're setting things up so it's easy to understand. Cause I, I don't think we want, like you said, want to either get into combat, combat science or using statistics. I don't think that's, a helpful exercise, I think, you know, so, you know, getting in a room with a couple of board members to, to, to work through it ahead of a workshop may be a good way to, to decipher, you know, information ahead of time. I know we do that with our own board in terms of ad hoc committees to be able to work through issues, you know, a little bit so they're a little bit better prepared coming forward so that the right information is being presented. So again, we're committed to um, doing that type of a process if you feel that would be helpful. Um, and that way, you know, you are getting the, those, the questions answered that you're looking for. Thank you for that. And then um, the other question is specifically on the um, uh, NIMPS uh, Martin model and not having, um, not having the model uh, itself and just having the results. And this is something that I think we've been um, encouraging access to for some time. And so since you're here, and I know you raised that in your comment letter, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to avoid sort of this combat science, but you know, what, what, why do you think this model and, and having access to it would be important? And could that take us to um, a, um, you know, sort of a more, this more enlightened dialogue that I think we're seeking? Yeah, so, so two things there. One, you know, certainly on the, the, I call them the physical tools, like the reservoir tools, shafts to temperature, things like that. Um, I think not all those tools are public available. I think that's an easy fix. And, and honestly, a lot of those tools, when you run them, they are tending to provide similar results. I think that's a good thing. But again, just having them out there to where they're available, people can run them, understand the data. I equate it to like, hey, we're both running Excel. 
Well, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. It's really, what do you, what's the equation you're putting in each cell? That's really what matters. And so don't tell me we're running both Excel, therefore models are the same. So I think just having them publicly available helps to build that trust, helps the modelers understand why their models may agree, why they may dis disagree. So not having those publicly available is leads to some, again, if we're talking about trust, I think it just leads to mistrust and what are we really moving forward? So I think on the physical models, we're kind of getting closer on the, the I call them the, the more of the biological models. Um, they, they haven't been historically available. And frankly, I think only one or two people can actually run them, which I think is also problematic. We did um, actually recently get copies of those. So we're actually trying to recreate those models ourselves to see kind of what they say. Um, we may have some results available for the workshop. And again, I keep saying the best way for people to learn about them is to experience them. We can't just say, be saying this model may not be right or there's these issues. It's Is there a way to have it to where you can actually experience the results that the model is providing and then, you know, people can kind of make the decision themselves. So we're, we're you know, we're working on that. Um, and, you know, we're also trying to update it. You know, most of these models are statistic. They're all statistically based. Um, they're missing the last six or seven years of data. And so, you know, we really feel like you need to have the last six or seven years of data in the model to make sure it's calibrated correctly as well. So we're also trying to work on that. But again, I think we've reached out to all the agencies saying we're working on this. We'd love to have a, a meeting about it, sit down, understand what was done, why it was done um, and seek input. And, and again, if there's a way that the, we can rally together and bring back a result, that would, that would really be in our interest. I mean, that's kind of what we're looking for. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bentner. You bet. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Much appreciated. Next, we have, and uh, I believe this is our last commenter, uh, Barbara Berry and Priya. Um, good afternoon, I guess, Chair Escovel and board members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, we appreciate the revised order um, that has been put forward. We see it as some movement toward improvement of managing the system for the health of the Delta during drought conditions. We agree with comments made today by uh, Dante Namalini Sr. and John Herrick regarding the TUCPs, the need for long-term drought planning and the need for transparency around the operation plan for the projects. We agree that harm to fish, wildlife, Delta farmers, recreation, tribal and EJ communities must be evaluated under the logic of the standards that have already been set in place by this board. In regard to HABs, water contractors bear part of the responsibility for HABs conditions. Today, it sounded like they do not want to be part of the responsibility for solving the problem around HABs. Having the IEP involved in more detailed study with the fine work being completed by water board staff around HABs is essential. Our program at Restore the Delta is moving forward with citizen science tracking and testing, but the, barriers at, uh, the barrier at Frank's track, overall temperature and flow conditions, along with discharge and local challenges lead to the creation of HABs. It is not one condition over the other. HABs are the manifestation of many problems. Solving such problems from drought management to save fisheries to protect water quality for all users is going to take shared sacrifice and shared responsibility from all water parties in California. Water contractors should not receive the benefit of export water during extreme drought without being part of the studies and part of the solutions. The same should be expected of DWR and the Bureau. Kicking the can down the road is not the answer. Right now, we need real-time tracking for HABs for public safety, uh, especially this year with an estimated almost 5,000 unhoused people living in a proximity to waterways in San Joaquin County alone. And we need long-term study for solutions that the IEP can lead on to happen simultaneously. It's not an either or. If our scrappy small NGO can gather the resources to help with real-time studies and train recent college graduates to be part of the solution, so then can the water exporters 
DWR and reclamation with their large scale resources. They can be part of real time tracking in a, in a timely manner. If some of the work has to be done in stages, I understand DWR's concern that you can't even begin certain studies until later in the year. We understand that science dictates those processes, but there should be findings submitted by DWR and the Bureau monthly during the length of the TUCP as research is completed. And then you can have a, a culmination of a final report at the end. We have made our concerns about HABs known to DWR for seven years. This is why we're impatient with extensions. They have dragged their feet on creating a real response and doing their part for the solution. We think everyone has responsibility and work has to be done constantly, continuously, and made transparent for us to get to a solution. Thank you for considering our comments. Thank you, Ms. Berrigan Priya. Appreciate the comments. Um, okay, that I believe is that brings us to the conclusion of our commenters. I appreciate everyone's good uh, comments and engagement with on this important decision here uh, before the board. Fellow board colleagues, uh, where does where does that best leave us? Um, you know, I I think uh, I'll just speak off the top here and just say that um, do want to. Um, better uh, understand if uh, we, we need a little extra time for DWR um, here and hearing from DWR that it is the case, want to set them up for some success here. And if March or April 30th, as I understand our, I know our updated timeline is, is still uh, a little too early, you know, uh, seeing how, what the temperature is here amongst us to agree to DWR's June 1st um, uh, recommendation there. It's not a final report. I think it is here that we're looking for, for a draft. Um, but we are also then uh, looking for uh, public engagement and a little bit of an expanded, I don't, I don't think ultimately scope, but at least um, you know, um, desire for engagement with external um, communities. Um, and so I can see where that's, that will be hard to do by, by the end of April. I mean, I know our uh, processes here and, and even when we're trying to make sure we're engaging in, in good public discourse, it, it takes time. So. I'm open to, I'll just signal, um, you know, in adjusting that date, whether uh, we need to, um, you know, I, again, I, I, I hear DWR's concern about being midstream and the request that we had from, I think it was, um, uh, it was uh, the, from the previous TUCP, um, I think it was uh, uh, condition number eight on uh, the uh, current harmful algal bloom report, you know, their concern about us expanding it necessarily and wanting to just um, be able to submit that. Um, I don't know. Again, I don't think it's necessary that uh, we're expanding too much here, what's required in it, other than really the engagement piece. So I think I'm, I'll just say I'm, I'm more apt to uh, adjust the date um, and hope that DWR can still incorporate the new direction. The other, uh, only other thing as well, and maybe here, Ms. Forsman or Ms. Riddle, you can help, um, you know, the, the switch from uh, by um, water diverters here, talking about then uh, looking for additional data around water rights and underlying contracts and or uh, contract amounts being uh, delivered. You know, the switch from uh, by to two um, or two to buy rather does seem to imply that DWR or reclamation is needing to uh, here gather water rights information that they don't necessarily have that they you know is not necessarily under their control. Is there um, just kind of reflection, wanting some some kind of feedback uh, around the why we changed it uh, to begin with, and and if this is an unintended consequence. I can go ahead and, and speak to the condition five in the TCP order regarding the Habs report, Habs and Aquatic Weeds. Um, I think you know if the board members re request that change to move the draft to June first, I think that's a change that can be um, you know made live here. I think, and I might look to Michael for some support on how we modify the change sheet if we create a second change sheet or just how we reflect that accurately. Um, and if I could indulge all five of you, I, I need to know when we went over the first change sheet, the changes to section 
had just a single strike through and a, a single underline and it's supposed to be double strike through and double underline. So I apologize for that formatting issue that slipped past us, but I wanted to be able to signal it as soon as I could. Um, but I think that all we need to do to make the change to make the draft due June 1st is to, um, you know, put that into a change sheet. I don't know if it needs to be in this first change sheet or a subsequent one. Yeah, and if it's truly just the dates, um, that can even be read into the record absent a change sheet. But I think we'll we'll assess that uh, for clarity. Even if uh, there are other changes the board members seek, uh, we can read those into the record and present them on the screen, even if it's not a formal change sheet. But let's just kind of see how things unfold from the board members' discussions. Okay, and then um, to the second point, and I think Diane and or Dana or Tina may want to chime in or your second question, um, Chair Esquivel, with respect to the reporting, DWR and Reclamation should be able to report accurately when they're diverting under their rights um, and when they're making releases pursuant to their rights. Um, and whether or not those are deliveries or releases to meet water quality objectives. Um, with respect to um, pulling together the pieces of information that folks are reporting under their own rights with water board and reporting requirements, that's information that um, you know, would need to, to come together. But I was um, thinking that Dana might want to, or Diane may want to provide something additional here. Yeah, and thanks, Erin. I can go ahead and chime in here. I think um, so. I I can understand the comment. Um, I think what we're interested in, and one of the issues that occurred with the TUCP order, was really understanding the totality of water use and and when the volumes of water that were being used. And we got a lot of questions and didn't have a good summary of that information. And so in order to provide that clarity for the public in terms of those issues and, and what volume of water is actually diverted under reclamation and DWR's rights and what volume of water is diverted under settlement contractors own rights. We were asking for that information, recognizing that there are two different deliveries. The contracts that the settlement contractors have include a mix of both. They include some underlying water right deliveries or not deliveries, but use, as well as some um, use under the um, under DWR and reclamations rights. And that is variable based on hydrology and, and the different year types. So to help to provide better context for the hydrologic conditions and really what proportion of this use, even though the total volume is, is a larger amount than what the projects use to provide that clarity of understanding for um, the public. We had been asked many questions on that. It, it was a topic of comment um, in the original TUCP discussion, it has been throughout time. So to try to put all that information together in one place so that it could be understood and some of those distinctions between contractual provisions and water right provisions could be clearer for the public. Um, we are happy to work with DWR and Reclamation on this. Some of this information is available in some format or another. It's not definitely not compiled in a readily accessible manner, and it's not all necessarily available, um, you know, in the context of helping to frame the board's drought related decisions. So that's really what the condition is looking for. Um, again, we have a regular dialogue with DWR and reclamation. Um, happy to continue to have that to work through um, how to report on this condition. And I think we could. We could also, you know, consider some change, specific changes if they have some specific changes. Um, and we recognize, you know, there might be components of a settlement contractor's use that's totally separate from the contracts, and we can talk through those types of issues as well. Great, thank you, Mr. Miss Riddle. Apologize, um, and especially I, I'm, I'm completely supportive of Condition Four and you know the intent here, which again is to to really unpack. Um, what what is being delivered under what rights, especially as we do our other work in in understanding and curtailing water rights? You know, this is the operation of the projects are mapped on top of a lot of complex interactions throughout the watershed, and and especially in years like this and in drought times, really getting a better 
um, uh, understanding of those can benefit everyone in the watershed in their decision making and trust. Again, a, a word I think that we continue to use around um, what's actually happening and under what rights and continue to, to, to provide better clarity for better decision making. So very supportive. But here, yeah, I and and I, I hear, you know, we're not looking to um, request from DWR or reclamation information that they they don't have under their control necessarily. And if there are those places and those the we're we're more than understanding and we'll ensure that we kind of ferret out again what is not an uncomplicated space that DWR and reclamation have to operate under when it comes to their contracts, their various provisions, and the underlying. Uh, rights that that may uh, underpin some of those deliveries and teasing all that out is no simple matter. But the more we can, uh, the more certainty and assurity we can have that we're being the best decision makers in the space that we can. So appreciate that. Appreciate the clarity here that again the the change from to to buy um, isn't meant to somehow capture um, a responsibility for DWR and reclamation to have data that they don't have uh, under their uh, control. So thank you. Uh, board member Firestone. Thanks. Um, I, I was just going to make a comment on the HABs portion. Um, so I think I, I know we haven't had a break yet. So <laughs> I feel like I'm not quite as um, sharp as I um, would like to be, but I am. Um, well, and just one moment, sorry, uh, board member, before we, we go on to a HABs discussion, I guess. Um, is is there anything to discuss further on uh, this item on condition four uh, for any of the board members? Okay. Well, I, I feel like there's probably going to be a number of things to discuss. Maybe are, are there anyway other than That's, those two things? Are there other? Yeah. Uh, are Are you looking to kind of um, uh, collect? Well, Collect. Yeah, I don't know. At this point, let's just collect. I apologize, as opposed to maybe trying to, to fully fully discuss out um, any of those two items. And I'll I'll let uh, Board Member Firestone go then. No, I guess I, I will say I actually would appreciate that. So maybe I'll wait to dive into Habs um, until like let's flesh out what all the issues are. That'd be great. Thanks. And, well, and yeah, I don't. And, are there is there ability to take like a five minute break? Of just, course. I feel like. That would be yeah. really helpful. <laughs> yeah, no, we've been going uh, for a while this morning here yet. Um, Vice Chair, uh, do you want to go or do would you like to go after a break? Oh, I can wait for after a break. That's fine. Okay. All right. Let's take a, a 10 minute break here um, and or uh, we could always just break for lunch. I was going to try to break for lunch after we provided some direction. So, you know, folks need to work on things. They can come back after that. So. Let's take a break and then we'll we'll see uh, where, where our discussion takes us here soon. So let's make it 10 minutes and we'll be back at say uh, 1225. And thank you board member. Talk to you here soon momentarily.
All right, it's 1226-ish. We can begin to gather back here. And so uh, at this point, uh, we flagged the have discussion um, and then also uh, condition four. So condition five and condition four here. Uh, is there anything others would like to flag for discussion? And then we can uh, get into um, either one of those two. Vice Chair. I apologize. I didn't hear the first part of what you said about. Oh, it's OK. Or I was joining it a couple, you know, a little bit late here. Uh, I was just flying. Uh, so, you know, we we have here before us, we'll have a discussion around uh, the HABs provision um, at condition five. And then additionally, um, if there's anything further on the um, the reporting on contracts and underlying water rights, uh, you know, condition four. And then wanting to hear if there's any other conditions or other parts of uh, the, the order that any of the board members are looking to discuss. Any flags and then we'll we'll go from there. Um, yes, I Great. believe it's it, uh, condition one on um, the temperature management plan. Great. Any others? Those were uh, those were my issues as well. So I think you flagged the right conditions. Great. And okay, not hearing any others. Uh, all right, Board Member Firestone, do you want to start off on a discussion further around the HABs um, condition? Uh, sure. I'll um, and thanks for the, <laughs> the quick uh, brain break. Um, I. Uh, so I agree with what you were saying, Chair. Um, I think that, you know, the intent here is to um, signal that, you know, this, as, as DWR said, that this is significant concern. We need to, um, you know, improve and integrate broader expertise into the analysis. I think this is a more specific narrow scope with our study within the scope of TCP actions, um, not sort of a broader um, general scope on, on HABs, but I also really appreciate the, um, you know, in the, the comments and, and letter um, that there's a recognition that we should be moving forward with a broader interagency effort around HABs in particular, um, and, you know, a broader scope. So, Fully appreciate that. I would love to have, um, you know, this this sort of tailored piece of what we're including here um, to build momentum and commitment to the sort of broader, more comprehensive efforts, um, and you know, more broadly around monitoring and studying and, and mitigating impacts in the delta. Um, that I think to um, some of the points um, in a. I don't, there may be some tweaks, maybe we could add in um, around just, in, we, we mentioned the interagency ecological program um, kind of in the beginning or top portion of the paragraph, maybe we could also include them in the, um, the, the bottom portion on, um, as well as maybe explicitly the Delta Science program um, on, trying to solicit or and review and consider comments um, and, and, you know, with that um, integrating and coordinating this work and the broader work as much as feasible. Um, I think that's everyone's intent. <laughs> uh, you know, we can't make, uh, yeah, th this, again, this isn't a broader effort. Um, this is more specific, but we certainly want it to be integrated and, and um, coordinated with and, and informed by um, that broader, more comprehensive effort that the Delta Science Program and the Interagency Ecological Program. Um, so agree that I think the intent of having a draft due date was to help provide a public process to get comments and input and review to allow the analysis to adapt. Um, 
I also really appreciate the points around um, it's a, we need to allow time for direct community and tribal outreach and engagement to get the kind of input and involvement um, that we, I think, all want. And so I you know, appreciate that we shouldn't say to do something and not give time to do it, <laughs> not setting folks up for success. I also doesn't, don't want to wait until something is final before we have a chance for public comment and review. And it, you know, it, I think it, it's appropriate to, um, you know, give staff level time to do that. Um, can be more more tailored public engagement um, and community and tribal engagement. Um, do want to get you know, some, some sense of that, how, of, of that um, timeline or, or overall kind of efforts and work plan. Um, I think that can be less formal, but I, I guess I do think it's really important to continue to include that, just utilize the board meetings as that public, um, that public space that it is. Um, so I think, Summarizing more concretely, if we, I'm, I'm fine. I, I think if we could add some language around um, including specific call, specific callouts to the Delta Science Program and the interagency um, ecological program within the second part of that paragraph, um, and maybe Delta Science Program in the first part, um, just when we're talking about uh, uh, solicit. Soliciting, soliciting um, the comments and uh, uh, review. I don't have the language right in front of me, um, but that portion. Um, and and I think in terms of due date, um, I'm fine with moving it back to accommodate you know the the vision and extra work that I think DWR is is looking to do on the. Um, community and tribal outreach and engagement on this. And I, I think that that's that will help everyone to have a better outcome. And I do want to make sure though that that's um you know we can we can support and follow um and coordinate on trying to make that outreach and engagement really successful over the next couple months. Um, so those are the sort of two concrete things. I don't know if other people have thoughts on HABs in particular. Thank you, board member. You know, I'll note, I think it's on page 24 of the order, which, you know, isn't necessarily within the direction, but, um, you know, still says here to inform future consideration of these issues upon completion of the report, the state board will also work with the Delta Science Program to complete a scientific review of the report associated have in aquatic weeds issues. So um, yeah. I think, you know, we do have some call out, but elevating it um, to your point and, and you know, incorporating the good suggestions from folks that yes, we need a, a larger discussion. Yes, there's many stressors and inputs. I think of our, you know, biological stimulatory work or, you know, um, other things that are ongoing for sure, um, you know, and still have a discussion around what does it mean in the context of the TUCPs and so far as potential impacts, not to, to blame it all on, on, on project operations though as well. Exactly. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm supportive of that. Other board members' um, thoughts and and uh, suggestion here around uh, the harmful algal bloom uh, condition. I guess I'll just flag. I concur with the intent of of doing the work and understanding the the causes of the, of the haves and engaging uh, with tribal and local communities and really, you know, getting a good sense for you know what the impacts of Drought are, but I am I am and, and I'm comfortable with the date extension to June first. I think that makes sense. And um, but I am a little still a little bit concerned about the scope of work and kind of the scope creep of the study a little bit. Only in terms of even if DWR and reclamation were to proceed with this engagement, it might get a little bit difficult for folks to understand even what the conversations about and separating TUCP from the broader trout impacts. And I think it's really important that that's clear that you know we're trying to understand the broad impacts as well as you know any specific impacts that the TUCP may have caused. But uh, gosh, I mean, 
trying to sort all that out in the next couple of months, knowing that we're heading uh, head on here into likely another dry season. Uh, it might just become a very difficult uh, process to really have meaningful engagement. So I guess I'm just, I want to flag that I'm a little bit concerned about having that piece of the work done here by June 1st and really having it done in a way that's robust and really uh, can uh, give us some sound conclusions and, and information that, to work from. So I just want to flag that ongoing concern. Yeah, thank you, board member. Um, I think you know, the fact that it is a draft can hopefully help there. But I think to your point, though, um, we need to make sure we're shaping appropriate expectations on you know how soon um, a, that more comprehensive discussion happens and what what exactly is um, expected can be completely had um, submitted to us by by June first. Um, amongst that, so thank you. Yeah, and I just, I'm just concerned at, you know, given that we're going into a dry, well, we're, we've just given last month and this month and how things are going already. Um, you know, I think that the, what this is helping us do is learn and then think about and be able to even better assess um, future potential TCPs and draw actions. And so just the, you know, priority and kind of urgency on getting that um, even as we are doing the um, kind of the, the more comprehensive and important. I mean, it, it, certainly um, I think nobody thinks that um, the projects are the only driver out there or, or even the, the um, even the single largest or something, you know, I think we all know that, that, that it's complex and that there's multiple drivers, but I, you know, this is, this is a very specific action that we're taking and we need, you know, we're, we need to understand. Um, so, and I also just appreciate that it's, you know, communicating engagement is, a, um, you know, is a, is an important skill set that, that we need to bring into this process. And so, um, I think we need to, it, it, this is a challenging one, <laughs> as are many of the things that, that um, we're discussing today. So, appreciate Yeah, it. I just, I, I, I agree with you completely. I just, I just want to make sure that expectations are leveled with what's possible in, in the next few months. And knowing that, the, you know, DWR and Reclamation weren't intending to, you know, weren't planning initially to do this level of work. It could, I mean, that, I think mes that message has been received. Not that they shouldn't be doing more, and can't do more. Uh, it's just, um, I think, um, perhaps identifying what, you know, seeing what they can do over the next few months, and then teeing up, like you say, you know, what can be done over the longer term here, and understanding the impacts. I think might be just having clarity of that. I think is important. Yeah, and I, I think the benefit of this whole uh, petition um, for reconsideration process is being able to clarify maybe the, the expectations that we have that may have just been more general on this. Um, so understanding that that wasn't, you know, the, the understanding um, that, that folks were moving forward on this on, but being able to kind of clarify and provide some more um, uh, specificity around this, I think, helps us have a better outcome and, um, you know, is it a benefit of this whole process? Agreed. Thank you both. Uh, any other uh, colleagues on, on this condition? And then otherwise, hearing something of uh, perhaps here uh, an agreement, moving the date to June 1st, um, and moving up uh, here, reference to the Delta Science Program and the IEP, and um, that we desire to make sure we're, we're appropriately um, parsing out here for the TUCP discussion what's required by June 1st, and giving nod to what our, you know, a, a far more comprehensive discussion needed around how to really manage harmful algal blooms, knowing that it's not just about this decision and this moment, and it's not all just the projects. So, um, I don't know how best to, to wordsmith some of that, but um, yeah, just making sure we're, we're making clear our intent on what we're desired here and, and that there is a need for a larger, uh, uh, more comprehensive discussion in flagging the entities that are best to, 
probably lead in what is already a lot of good engagement. I know um, DWR mentioned USGS and their continued work there. That's a continuum of work I know we're doing as well with folks. So there's a real opportunity, I think, to better stitch together um, what is a, an important have discussion, I think, of Clear Lake, I think, of other communities, really, that are also uh, challenged by this. And here, a very complex um, system in, in watershed, certainly, but uh, I think there are similar opportunities to better understand our, our space and ability to address it. So was that helpful, Diane? Yes, um, I think um, your suggestion that we hear all the comments um, and then take a lunch break and then we'll come back and have a proposal for you that you can discuss some more is a good suggestion. I think we uh, we have an idea of where you all want to move with this and can propose some edits. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to condition uh, number four. And then we'll finish off uh, with condition one, temperature management. So this condition uh, here is again, uh, our request to the projects to better uh, here untangle and help us understand uh, deliveries and under what right um, as DWR and reclamation have uh, information and access to um, and know that you know there's certainly a continuum of information to the actual diverters that we're also interested in, but we're not looking to make responsible reclamation in DWR for. Um, I don't see, I, I, I appreciated Diane's explanation. Um, I'm not seeing any need for change here, but let's have discussion. I think Vice Chair, you wanted to discuss um, further as well. Thank you. And so I think on this, I'd like to hear from Ms. Riddle about um, your uh, plans or the division's plans going forward. Um, we have, um, let's see here, we, ha we have a date and what sort of communication has occurred um, uh, between the division, this, the uh, water users and um, uh, the projects on this condition and what sort of ongoing dialogue do you um, intend on having? So I'm looking for ongoing dialogue and communication between the division. Um, the other thing that um, I'm looking for is an opportunity for us as board members, and I don't know that anything needs to be changed here, but um, I suspect that because of the um, controversial nature of this, that um, there may be um, uh, differing views on what should be provided and what that versus what that information could potentially lead to. And to the extent that there are any conversations um, regarding those issues, um, I would like the opportunity to be able to um, listen in so that I could become better informed, you know, as a board member. And so I don't know that this needs to go to the level of a full blown, you know, information item. It may at some point, but um, looking for an opportunity to kind of tease out what those issues are. Um, as they emerge. Sure. Um, in terms of this specific condition, because the order on reconsideration is subject to ex parte communications, we haven't actually had any communications thus far on the condition. For other purposes, um, the curtailment planning process, we have been having a number of very helpful discussions, as MBK alluded to, <clears throat> with them on our specific needs for curtailment purposes. Um, they're a little bit different for just understanding and providing understanding for the public about this. There's a lot of confusion about this issue of um, reclamation's rights and their settlement contractors' rights and a you know recognition that the settlement contractors have their own rights and that the total picture is sort of reflected in the contract. Trying to provide that clarity. Some of that, again, that information you can pull together. I think we'd like to have the help of Reclamation DWR pulling that together so that we can have a clear picture for the public. They, they can start to gain an understanding and appreciation of these issues. Um, and we have an understanding for our own purposes only, um, you know, for the temperature management planning purposes and the TUCP, only the water, the projects are diverting and delivering is subject to the board's conditions. We don't currently have um, temperature management planning and water quality control plan implementation requirements on those underlying water rights. So there is there is a difference and there's a difference when it comes to temperature management planning. There's a difference when it comes to TECP related issues. Um, so understanding 
what is subject to a condition, what is not, is helpful in the for the planning purpose, helpful for the public to understand those issues. Um, so in terms of, we've already, again, had some dialogue with on the curtailment side of the equation. Um, and we, again, that's been really helpful and we are gaining a better understanding. I think we can work with some of that information and work the water users to package the information appropriately. Um, and again, happy to get the board members involved where appropriate. Um, I don't, this was, I, I don't see this as being a Herculean effort. I mean, I, I think it's combining, compiling some of the information. I agree. Some of it is, are, it's already being put together. It's putting it together in one place so people can understand it. And when we get questions from the public about these issues, we'll have some place to point to for those answers. Um, so I hope that I'm, I want to make sure I'm answering your questions. I don't, I'm, I hope I touched on all of them, but let me know if not. Yeah, I, I might be anticipating more uh, challenge of this than what it turns out. So I, I guess at this point, I would just request that you keep us informed through uh, information updates um, and, and the public. And uh, I would like to request once that information comes in, an opportunity to have a briefing as well so that... Um, and at that point, ex parte would be lifted. I'm, you know, questioning uh, that, you know, just making sure that way um, you could help to highlight um, any of the challenges that you're getting in terms of receiving the information or differing views on whether or not you're entitled to receive certain aspects of information um, and, and giving us an opportunity uh, to meet with uh, stakeholders uh, prior to um, any conclusions in the in the event that there that, that these challenges emerge? It's hard to say. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, definitely ripe uh, for an informational item, um, or and or just uh, continued just daylighting. Um, and you know, here I appreciate Vice Chair uh, your good good questions and engagement around all this. I know it's not uncomplicated. So, uh, Board Member Morgan. Hi, thank you. Um, and so, I just, you know, I echo the vice chair's you know comments there, and just also ask to be you know just briefed in you know uh, whether it's info item, because I guess when, when I'm reading the condition at the end here, it states the monthly and total volume of water diverted under all rights and claims by these users, and so. I guess when I'm reading it, I'm just reading it, and maybe I too just have, I understood, Ms. Riddle, you know, what your explanation was, and I appreciate that and agree with with it, and I'm just, you know, wondering if there's also, if there's going to be challenges, and um, just that ongoing coordination with, you know, staff and DWR of pulling together that information and really understanding what that information is um, that is being asked. Um, yeah, so I think what's being asked for is to provide some clarity about contracts versus water rights. There's the contract, the contract represents a mix of water rights It represents in part and in some years and for some water right holders, the entire amount of that contract might actually be an underlying right. In a drier year, it's probably going to be less so the case and some of that water is going to be DWR reclamations water rights. It's So the contract, I think, represents the total use. These water users might also have their own rights and I think that's where it maybe gets a little bit tricky. They might have, you know, some of the settlement contractors might have their own a rice straw decomp rights that don't have anything to do with the settlement contracts. And I understand that complexity and we can certainly work through that issue, but for the rights that are um, associated with the contract, that's, that's I think the clarity that we're trying to get and a recognition, and I agree, we should have a recognition that there might be other rights that are not associated with the settlement contract, but just trying to get that clarity of understanding about how much water is there under the contract, how much of it is under the underlying right and how much of it is under the settlement contract right so that you, the, we and the public have that understanding for, for what's at play and what is subject to certain decisions and what is not subject to certain decisions um, so that we, we can clarify that. Um, 
I mean, I think, you know, our conversation so far on this topic with um, MBK and others have been really productive. So, I mean, I'm not, I mean, it's possible we'll run into some issues, but um, in terms of information exchange, we've had a really good dialogue so far in the curtailment arena. Um, I would expect, you know, we could do the same here. We've had, we've had really good interactions with DWR staff and reclamation staff, and same on reporting related issues for curtailments. And when they encounter um, constraints, we've been happy to work with them and work through those issues. So I think we can continue to do that. And if there is, if we come at some sort of an impasse, I think we can definitely let you all know and make sure that you're informed on um, where there might be any sort of disagreement or, I mean, I guess disagreements can also be documented in a report to the board. If, you know, there's one viewpoint on a water right disposition and another viewpoint, then that could be documented um, as part of the reporting. I would suspect, I mean, that, you know, a lot of these issues ultimately getting a real clarity of understanding would probably, you know, only come after a full adjudication or something that, you know, isn't in the cards at this point. So um, I understand there might be multiple viewpoints on this. Um, if that's the case, I think that can be documented and part of the reporting provision as well. Great. Thank you, Ms. Riddle. And thank you, board member. Any other discussion and hearing here that um, what uh, folks will try to come back to us with is uh, just additional clarifying language that reflects um, much of our discussion here just on what exactly it is we're, we're asking for. Again, uh, rights kind con tied to contracts uh, and not, again, things that are outside of reclamation or DWR's ability to uh, provide data uh, to us on. So thank you. Uh, but before closing off, any further discussion, anything else to flag on this condition? Okay, then moves us on to, I think our last issue that we can discuss, uh, provide some direction and then uh, have a late lunch. And I apologize and appreciate everyone's um, willingness to let me be a little inhumane sometimes in our breaks. Um, so uh, condition number one, uh, Vice Chair, uh, you wanna kick, off, kick us off in the discussion? Thank you for that. Um, okay, so my, um... I don't have a specific request yet. Just want to talk with staff uh, on a couple of areas here. So similar to condition four, I'm looking for what sort of um, uh, interaction is expected to occur between the division and um, uh, the bureau on condition four in light of changing conditions, hydrology, and um, also um, I continue to have angst on, I mean, I think early planning is good, but what is the expectation? So this is not the first time that um, uh, we as a board or you know, through the division have uh, pressed uh, the bureau to provide an earlier than what they would have otherwise preferred temperature management plan. And so I guess the first question really is, is there something different that we're expecting in this condition than what has been expected in the past? Really looking to you know, better set expectations. Um, and in that regard, I've just I've always you know, agreed with the concern that the Bureau has about you know, um, earlier than where the information is available. And so I would probably feel more comfortable um, if on um, condition 1E e, um, uh, with respect to the April 1 date that it refers to say an initial draft, you know, some way that we all truly recognize you only have so much information in, it's a draft unlike say, um, you know, the, the HAB draft where that information will come in and it's truly, you know, the draft report of what they would expect to be a final, depending on the comments coming in. But this draft is a little different. It truly is an initial draft. And then, you know, the final draft um, incorporating more of the information as it presents itself. So I'm open to how we, you know, sort of address that, but also want to better understand um, sort of expectations uh, going in. And then the second point is, I just continue to struggle on the modeling issue. We've been asking for it. We've been encouraging 
um, uh, the modeling information coming in from NIMPS. And so we've got sub F reclamation in coordination with other agencies um, shall make information developed in the process readily available as soon as practicable. But you know, how how do we how do we push this a little bit more? And getting back to my earlier comment, I'm not I'm not looking for getting more information in so we can have this, you know, back and forth uh, point counterpoint, but really looking to uh, get more information in that will will truly help move these issues along into further uh, clarifying um, expectations. So um, on the modeling front, I, we we hear the transparency issue loud and clear and the additional um, provision at the end of the condition one that we added was an answer to that. I, I know it's not quite exactly what everyone would want out of it, but the, the reason it's written the way that it is is we only have authority through this order to establish requirements on DWR and reclamation. We don't really have any authority to establish requirements on the fishery agencies. The intent is, I, I hope clearly there, that we that would be both an obligation on the board's part. If we're considering information, we're going to be sharing it transparently, um, as well as you know, reclamation working through their convening of the Sacramento River Temperature Management Planning Process to be doing that work with us. And the fishery agencies, I, I mean, they're well aware of this issue as well and have been discussing it. So I, I think everybody is well aware of the transparency component. Um, I think in terms of discussing the, the details of what is and is not available and those kinds of things, I, I think a lot of the materials are available. Maybe they weren't available exactly at the right time last year, those kinds of things. We can address those things. I think this is also a good topic for discussion at the workshop when we have it, when we have the fish agencies here. Um, I, I think you'll probably hear from them that they're, everybody's got a shared um, goal of having transparency. So we're all dealing with the same information. I mean, from that perspective, there's always going to be some uncertainty that we have to work with as well. And we're gonna to have to figure out how we work through that issue. This year, um, particularly if it's gonna end up being a really dry year, how do we factor in the uncertainty component into our decision-making process and, um, you know, but make sure we're all looking at the same information. I think that's a shared goal of all of the agencies. Some of this, um, you know, last year we had some rapidly evolving tools um, and other information that I think ultimately everything did end up becoming clear and transparent to everybody, but we can, can we should continue to work on that process. We've been talking about it, started talking about it last year. We've been talking about it through this year. Um, and I know fish agencies are sensitive to that as well. So um, I think if, if we could put a requirement in the fish agencies, we would have done that too. We just don't have that authority. So um, it's, it is definitely, again, a shared goal on that front. Um, in terms of the timing issues, this continues to be a, a struggle for us and, and for everyone that has to deal with temperature management that you have the water supply planning decisions backing right up to the temperature management planning decisions and how we navigate that territory is really challenging. Um, I think we have flexibility in the way that we consider the temperature management plans and evaluate them. We also do have updated hydrologic information on both a daily basis. The Bulletin 120, the DDRBR produces is updated every week. Um, the official forecasts are based on the monthly updates. We recognize that, but if we're gonna be in this dry condition, we might need to get a little more nimble in terms of looking at, at evolving hydrology and make sure that we're not continuing to stick to 90% of the hydrology showing it's 99%. We also have daily data from the California Nevada River Forecast Center. That's what we're using for our curtailment decisions. Um, and, and I think everybody's really after last year, DWR and the forecasting, we're all very sensitive to trying to provide more timely and accurate information. So um, I understand the, the timing issues. April is honestly, it, it's still fairly late in terms of the planting decisions, et cetera. That's, you know, that's happening, you know, now really. So I, that's gonna continue to be a challenge. We can, um, when we meet at lunchtime, explore concepts that maybe help us to try to navigate this issue. It will probably continue to be a challenge for us just because there is that, just that 
inherent issue of the all of the hydrology becoming clear and the needs be, being clear at the same time. And so um, it, it, I, it will continue to be a challenge for us, I think, unfortunately, with this issue until we have longer term planning processes to full, more fully address them. I think, you know, on on a yearly basis like this, it's it's a little bit challenging. Hopefully, um, through the reconsultation process and other processes, we can have better long term planning activities that um, help us to avoid being in these circumstances where um, the the needs for the fishery are being evaluated at the same time as the deliveries for the water users are being made and those um, dynamics, we can figure out some creative tools to deal with those dynamics, but they have been, and I fear we're probably gonna continue to be difficult to navigate. But we will consider, um, we'll, we'll talk about some um, ways that we can get after the concern that you're addressing in that condition. Great, thank you. Thank you both incredibly, and Vice Chair uh, particularly here. Uh, you know, we always uh, invite everyone here to follow along with our decision-making, and we can't do that if we're not able to have uh, out there the models that we're depending on the information that we have. And to Mr. Bettner's uh, point, uh, replicable uh, repli replicable uh, data in modeling. Um, so uh, the open and transparent component of all our water data work is really, really uh, front of mind. So thank you, I appreciate that. Other uh, colleagues uh, want to make comment and or um, reflect on, on this condition. I don't have anything to add to that specifically. I, I'll be curious to see what staff come up with, um, but I agree kind of the, again, this is similar to condition five and my concerns there, it's about setting expectations um, and for everybody, for the public, for the Bureau of DWR, you know, anyone who's involved with the, these processes, it's, it's uh, being clear about that. And I, I appreciate that it's very complicated and time sensitive here, but at the same time, uh, if we can be a little bit more clear with in our condition, I think that'll help everybody here in the coming months. Yeah, I, I believe, um, yeah, the, the addition of the word draft or initial, you know, may help there again to set some, some expectation as the vice chair recommended. So thank you board member. Others? Anything that we haven't covered, still always time to flag other conditions or issues. Okay, hearing none, then Ms. Riddle, do you have everything you need uh, direction-wise from us? Uh, anything further to clarify or help before we go to the lunch break? Um, I will, I believe so, but I will let the other, the rest of the members of the team chime in if they think there's something that we should ask clarify. I am not seeing anything, so I think we are good to go. Okay, thank you. And again, appreciate everyone's uh, patience here. It's been uh, a long morning and here into the afternoon and an incredibly good discussion. So thank you for everyone's contributions. Let's go ahead and take um, 30 minutes or would you like 45, um, Ms. Riddle? We better say 45. Okay, <laughs> Just, yeah. okay. Let's, let's do 45. And so we'll return here at 1.50. Um, and uh, continue our discussion and deliberation. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. Have a great lunch, see you soon.
All right, everyone. It is 1.50. We can begin to gather back. Hope everyone had a good uh, break and or lunch. And we'll see if uh, Ms. Riddle has for us some changes. Yes, Aaron is emailing those to Janine right now. So it should be momentarily. We should have that. Just want to let you know I sent it a moment ago, so it should be showing up. Yeah, thanks everyone. Appreciate the patience. Well, we're pulling up here um, the recommended uh, changes that were developed over the break. So we'll say sit tight for a second more. Janine, can you uh, confirm that you have the change sheet? Yes, I have it. I just got okay. it. Awesome. So I'm sending it to Courtney to post, right? I mean, to put up on the screen. Courtney, did you receive it? Not yet. Okay. Got it now, so I'll put it up. Okay. Okay. Diane, are you going to walk through these? Um, you can go ahead and do that if you'd like. Okay. Um, so this is the same change sheet we were looking at earlier, but with updates. Can you scroll down? Okay, stop there. I just want to highlight that we did make the double strike through double, double underline change that I talked about earlier and continue scrolling. Keep going. And then you can stop, or I guess continue a little bit further and stop at the, there you go. So this is condition one. Previously, it wasn't in the change sheet. It's in the change sheet now. 
when we finalize the change sheet, I don't think we'll include the highlighted sections. We just wanted to make it easier for everyone to see what was changed. In response to the water board members' comments, we added um, an initial draft Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan to Part E. And then we added a sentence stating that the executive director may grant an extension to the May 1, 2022 due date upon a showing that the deadline cannot be met in the exercise of reasonable diligence because relevant and material temperature management information was not timely available. Should we read if through you, all of these and then have questions or how do you want to do let's, that? Uh, let's go ahead and, and have them discussion here and we can then knock okay. them out um, as you as you take through. Um, board members, uh, vice chair, uh, does this reflect uh, what you know, our discussion was and uh, some of the concern? Yes, that does. Thank you. Okay. Any any concerns from board members regarding the changes in language? Okay. Hearing none. Thank you, Ms. Forsman. We can move on to the next one. Okay. Um, go ahead and scroll down. I think to the next one is condition four. Um, I think it's five. We didn't have any changes. To okay. four. We had a discussion of condition four, right? But I don't believe we heard any direction to make changes. So the only changes were to five. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, so here we added um, the Delta Science Program in the first sentence as an agency to coordinate. We also added the definition of the IEP acronym because we mentioned it again below. So essentially the first sentence is just changed to in coordination with the State Water Board, the Central Valley Water Board, and the Interagency Ecological Program, Delta Science Program, DWR and Reclamation shall complete the special study required by Condition 8 of the June 1, 2021 TUCP order on the prevalence and extent of harmful algal blooms and expansion of invasive aquatic weeds in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Then uh, we also added text that starts after the word prevalent. And I'll read that into the record. This work shall be coordinated with IEP and DSP and any broader watershed evaluation of HABs and aquatic weeds. Then we went ahead and we did change the, the draft date to June 1st. So the next sentence reads, a complete draft report shall be submitted to the State Water Board by June 1st, 2022. Then the sentence that starts after board meeting uh, also incorporates IEP and DSP. I'll read that into the record. In coordination with State Water Board, Central Valley Board, staff, IEP and DSP, DWR and Reclamation shall review and consider comments from the State Water Board and the public and modify the final report as appropriate based on these comments. And that's the, that's the end of those changes. Thank you. Uh, fellow colleagues here, does this reflect and or any concerns with uh, uh, the uh, language? That looks great to me. Looks <clears throat> looks good. I'm just I'm reading the last sentence there, and the only thing that I recall was I think DWR was had asked for longer to finalize the report, depending on maybe the extent of the comments that the water board and others may provide. So I don't know if that 30 days. Uh, oh, you have the extension in there. I apologize. Yeah. So I think that works for me. Never mind. Thank you. Any other discussion, concerns with this language? And then otherwise? Can I just note, yes. I see a few clerical issues we need to fix. I'm assuming as per usual, we can go ahead and make those clerical issues with extra comments, those kind of spacing issues, et cetera. But just want to note, there are a few of those I can see. Definitely, and thank you. Okay, I think we can consider this uh, then addressed and thank you. And and that's is that the extent of the changes? That is all of them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Then, board members, how are we feeling? Uh, and anything further to try to discuss uh, or flag here? You know, especially after perhaps a, a lunch, you may have had a, a moment, an epiphany. Um, but anything to to help uh, us discuss and or come to a, a vote.
Well, uh, Chair, I'll go ahead and um, make a motion. Um, and uh, before doing so, just want to make a few comments and just say that I think that we've come a long way in um, not just specifically on uh, this petition for these petitions for reconsideration, but just also um, having um, and moving toward more open dialogue on these issues regarding temperature management um, and how uh, we address drought issues. And I know and understand a lot of the concerns uh, that were raised regarding uh, why go back on a petition um, that, that occurred last year and impose conditions going forward. Um, I'm not real comfortable with that, but you know, recognize that that's the sense of the board. And I think that um, it is in keeping with our efforts at being transparent. So why not put it out there? I don't know that it needs to go as far as a condition, but I'm you know, really wanting to work together as a board and know that that's important um, uh, to some of my colleagues here. And so um, I view it in the spirit of uh, telegraphing early on, you know, to get, uh, the, the, as I was saying um, in my comments earlier, just the importance of understanding expectations and where there are challenges where things can't be met, recognizing that um, and having, um, you know, these discussions in greater context. Um, uh, some of the discussions that occurred about, you know, conditions beyond control and, you um, uh, the changing hydrology and just how things are, it's just um, um, uh, constantly a moving target. And so I think that um, I feel that um, a lot of my concerns um, have been addressed, not all, but um, it's part of the process. And so I really am um, looking forward to updates, ongoing updates from staff as they work through uh, the specific requirements here, keeping us updated and us being through our role of being balanced, us being in a position to be able to make adjustments and be nimble. And I don't think that this overly ties our hands um, in doing that as we go forward in this temperature management plan and other activities that uh, we're likely to be faced with. Um, so with that, I am um, prepared to make a motion. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Lawford, please correct me if, uh, or guide me if you want me to, uh, do you want us to have uh, two separate, uh, well, we don't need two because it's a, we've all combined this in one petition for reconsideration. So um, approval of the uh, order on pe the petitions for reconsideration for both the temperature management plan and also the um, uh, temporary urgency change petition decisions issued by our executive director. And uh, with the inclusion of both the initial change sheet and the additions read into the record by Ms. Forsman. Sounds good. And then just to do a little bit of a brass tack on that, uh, as Ms. Riddle indicated, there are a couple minor clerical errors um, that uh, Ms. Townsend and the division staff can clean up, nothing of which will change the, the substance of the order or the change sheets. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair, for just the, the good words and continued leadership in this space. And um, to your point, you know, uh, we're, we're looking to continue to create the space where we're being more open and transparent in our, our decision making and uh, having a collaborative uh, relationship with the projects and with all the, the, the many folks here in the community, water rights holders and community members themselves that are um, part of our discussion and decision making. here. So just thank you. I appreciate your, your good perspective and uh, your motion. Is there a second? Yeah, I, I'm, I'll I'm. make a second, um, but before I do that, I'd like to share a little bit of my perspective as well, if I could, because uh, I'd like to build a little bit on, on some of both of your comments. And for me, I was at a point, you know, when the draft of this order first came out that I was pretty uncomfortable uh, with the direction um, of some of the conditions. And uh, I have spent a lot of time thinking through this or through the conditions and building comfort and recognizing that this is a very small window that we have here in between you know, coming off of last year and moving rapidly towards um, this you know, dry, what appears to be another dry season. And that we do need to be proactive in uh, making decisions and making sure that we have information, the best information we can possibly have in place 
to make those decisions in the coming months. And I, I got to a point where I just, I felt like I couldn't, um, you know, we needed to, to be decisive here. And so I agree, you know, this is about um, working together. This is about collaboration uh, as a board. And that is important to me as well. And, you know, on that, I, um, I'm thinking about this in two different ways. And one is um, kind of the retrospective also in terms of our process getting to this point and reflecting that this is eight months later, give or take, um, from when the initial you know, TUCP order was issued from when the temperature management plan was approved. And um, what I don't wanna find ourselves in is uh, in 2020, February, 2023, uh, having the same conversation in retrospect of, you know, any sort of drought actions or other requests that are could, maybe submitted this year, which obviously we don't know um, what the coming months have in store. But um, what I wanted to signal is the importance of us being nimble and um, comfortable um, with our process that we can make decisions um, more effectively and rapidly because these you know, what we experienced last year were urgent requests uh, from the projects. And we had protests from many, you know, different groups out there with urgent concerns about those actions and what those implications were. And, you know, unfortunately, when we're in a place where we're here eight months later, uh, reflecting on that, it's way too late, obviously, to make any course corrections, if there were even an ability to make one at that time. So, I don't know how much faster we can get. I recognize that there's an immense burden on staff. The workload is incredible. I appreciate everything that everyone's done, um, but I do think we should consider how we can improve our process in terms of decision-making um, and ways to expedite uh, critical path decisions, if that's, if that's possible and, and when that situation arises. Um, and on that as well, I and was reflecting on John Herrick's comment about long-term drought planning. And that really resonated with me too, because I think if we really embrace that notion of how do we get better uh, long range, just anticipating that we're in, we're in this climate change space, I think we can anticipate a drought pretty much every year. Uh, I think we're gonna find ourselves in almost every November, December, wondering what you know the coming months have in store and knowing that there's all this uncertainty out there. Um, and there's been a whole host of actions to, to get better at that, but there hasn't been a cohesive plan in place. And so I just wanna share that as a board member, I am open to ideas, suggestions, thoughts, creativity, thinking outside the box. You know, how can we get better? What, what sorts of actions should we be thinking about? What, what should a plan look like uh, to get a better um, and more proactive long-term drought approach in place uh, that embraces all the needs of the different water users, the agencies, um, state and federal projects, all of it. Uh, it's so complicated. I mean, obviously this is not something that will happen in a couple of months or maybe even a couple of years, but I really think we should have that conversation. And so just again, welcome any thoughts there as we go forward. So I think I'll leave it at that. And as I said, I am comfortable uh, making a second of the motion of the vice chair. Thank you. Thank you for those good points, uh, board member. Um, definitely the, the long term has to stay within view here, even as we're just considering, um, you know, potential uh, for uh, actions in this coming year. So thank you. Other board colleagues, uh, uh, still space here to reflect, uh, provide direction, um, would gladly hear, hear further from folks. Okay, hearing none then, uh, Ms. Thompson, can you please call a roll call vote? Yes. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Board Member Morgan. Aye. Board Member Firestone. Aye. And Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, the vote is unanimous and appreciate, again, just the, the really incredible dialogue and discussion here on what are not easy matters, but um, feel good as we now are, are more free now that ex parte um, 
ban on, on discussion around these things is lifted and our vote is, is complete and look forward to, I know it's gonna be a lot of engagement and discussion as we continue to prepare, understand, and uh, best respond to conditions as they present themselves this coming year. So thank you everyone. I appreciate the commitment to what I heard was a lot of common theme around um, openness and transparency around data and decision-making and uh, appreciate that we, we very much all have that in common. Uh, that concludes this item and appreciate everyone's time again with it. Uh, we are now on to uh, just uh, informational items. The last couple, num item number four here, board, rem uh, board member reports. Is there a board member that would like to kick us off? I can start if my voice holds up here, sorry. <laughs> um, so on February 7th, I spoke at CMUA's Capital Day and my talk focused on the drought, water resiliency, and the historic state and federal investments. And the you know the highlight really was around the um, investments that have been made over this past year. And so it was really nice to be able to join them on the day and have that discussion. Fantastic, thank you, board member. Others, and I'm quickly trying to um, peruse my, my own calendar to see what I would like to have uh, flagged. I don't have anything to report this time. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a report, thanks. Great, I'll just flag um, last week on uh, the 9th, I was at the Senate uh, budget hearing and uh, uh, the topic of drought uh, was uh, front, front and center and uh, some of the requests for resources that uh, we have here in the current budget. You know, part of that is a $250 million um, uh, amount that we have uh, flagged with uh, Department of Finance for a need uh, here to adjust to what conditions may provide, you know, as we continue to go through the water year here, we'll be able to have a better sense uh, really of what uh, we're going to need insofar as resources to continue to respond. So it was a good budget hearing, uh, a lot of good discussion, and I appreciate uh, the questions from, from the senators, including Senator McGuire, um, who, as you all know, uh, represents here the Russian River watershed. Um, and has been a, a, a strong advocate for the good collaborative work that has been able to go on this last uh, summer. So just uh, wanted to flag uh, that discussion. Anything, uh, Vice Chair? Yes, um, I was. Um, I had the pleasure of being on a panel uh, that the Delta Protection Commission put together for Delta Leader, their Delta Leaders Program. And um, joining me on the panel was uh, Melinda Terry with the North Delta Water Agency, Barbara Puria, um, uh, Berrigan, um, uh, Jennifer Pierre, thinking there's somebody else and it's escaping me now, but it was very good discussion. Uh, had to be careful about ex parte communications. So I was kind of jumping on and off the panel, but um, a good discussion. And I was impressed with the group that they have um, a good cross section um, of the community within the Delta and surrounding area. And so just um, always um, uh, excited about opportunities to bring new voices into the discussion. You're here and great to hear about that. Glad, glad you're, you're out there and uh, participating. Okay, I think that wraps up our board member reports and brings us to our last item, which is the executive director's report. Ms. Sobeck. Anything to flag? Um, yes, thank you, Chair Escobar. Um, I did want to um, note that um, at, at our last meeting, or perhaps the meeting before, board members asked for to make sure that there was an update on the status of the arrearages program payments. Um, and it is in the um, executive director's report um, on page um, 18. And there's also a reference to the wastewater portion of that on page two. Um, but I just want to take one second to highlight that, and we will do a more extensive um, update when we finish the wastewater portion of this program. But on the um, drinking water side, and again, this is the program where we received um, substantial dollars to, um, to get to water systems, to get to customers, to pay down um, debt that was customer debt that was accrued during um, COVID. And so it was very important. There were very strict time, um, time constraints on these dollars. Um, but let me just talk about the bottom line so far on the drinking water side, that there were 658 applications 
um, and that um, the requests were for just over $300 million. And that as of the first week of February, um, just over $275 million of checks had been cut by the controller's office and the rest of them should be getting out soon. Um, the deadlines were just amazing in this program. Um, it's really sort of crushing. It was sort of crushing at the outset when we looked at it in terms of the burden, you know, to do the right thing quickly. Um, and I just want to make sure that you all recognize that so far the Water Board has met every single statutory deadline. Um, it beat by three weeks the um, the date for surveying water systems to figure out what the outstanding debt was. Um, the board um, um, at the same time um, voted to adopt the guidelines and began began um, accepting applications within two weeks of the adoption of those those guidelines. Um, and then began distribution of funds um, on November 1st, and now we are virtually done paying those out. It was a massive, um, it was a massive effort. Um, we're, we're working on phase two of that massive effort, which is um, starting, um, you all, the board adopted um, the guidelines for the wastewater side of this program um, at its last meeting, and the online app application went live on February 1st. So we're hoping to move that side of the equation just as quickly as the drinking water side. It's actually, I, I think it it just shows the enormity of the drought issues that um, that getting this three hundred million dollars, this first three hundred million dollars out, has um, hasn't kind of uh, reached the level of awareness that we would normally have for getting out this amount of funds in this short of a time. And I do want to just commend. Um, staff and, and the board for working with us to make sure that everything, all the pieces came together to in order for us to get that money out um, quickly. We did have to redirect um, a lot of staff because this was a priority and it did have those strict um, strict deadlines. That was important. It was a priority. Um, it was necessary and appropriate. Um, we are going to see um, a dip in some of our um, core base workload, things like sanitary surveys for um, for a little while until we kind of uh, administration of um, underground tank fund um, um, mission um, while we kind of get those folks back um, when we are able to get those folks back into their regular jobs. But I do think it is a tribute that on a really on really short notice, a really important program, which was not an extension of functions that we already do. It was really a, a brand new set of um, a brand new a brand new function um, working with entities that we're we're accustomed to working with, but in a different way and trying to get different information and trying to get dollars out for different reasons than we are accustomed to. So we were able to do that in a short amount of time. So we'll we'll have we'll bring the team in and, and have a much more detailed um, discussion later. But I did want to just um, bring it to your attention um, that it is the basic information is in the executive director's report. Thank you for for really highlighting this. Um, you know, the, it, it is you know unfortunate in a way that um, this uh, in any other year would have been alone. Um, you know, celebrated real a lot more attention to it. Uh, but the fact that uh, folks here have done an incredible job, good quiet work, um, not uncomplicated work at all when it comes to how uh, debt and arrearages are handled by the many different uh, flavors of systems and. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's it was a lot, and for the first time to have set something up that um, the scale, you know, truly is 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 incredible. So, thank you for for highlighting that. Um, I, I share your your just desire to acknowledge and thanks here to everyone that made this incredible moment uh, possible. We're and we're fortunate here to be moving quick on the wastewater arrearages, and so I look forward to that. You know, a little more of a thorough um, you know a discussion around it because it is something that here feels like extra credit given just how incredible a year uh, it's been, but um, is in of itself just a, a huge accomplishment. So thanks for, for highlighting that, Ms. Obeck. Really appreciate it. Anything uh, from fellow colleagues, both on this and then otherwise, any um, anything to highlight in the executive director's report or any questions? I'll just say thank you. And I also look forward to, um, you know, digging in even more, like you said, um, that, and, you know, I think we've said this multiple times, but just uh, 
doesn't hurt to reiterate thanks and how impressed um, I also am with not just what we've been able to accomplish, but I mean, I've been able to see um, the individuals that are, you know, it really with um, just passionately trying to make this work and make sure that people are getting the funds that, um, that, you know, the state has set out to make sure that they can access and um, just couldn't be more impressed and proud with um, how that's gone and how we've done this. Um, and just really look forward to kind of learning and the reflections on it even more. Um, great to see. I definitely saw those that update in there. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just, there's a lot of good stuff in this report. So um, I, just one thing I would mention, um, just because I know we had a discussion on an uh, information item now a while ago with um, the Central Valley Reg uh, Regional Board, on the ILRP program, but there's an update in here that have a lot of the metrics that we were asking him about, or you know, the executive officer about, um, uh, in terms of the number of folks that uh, wells that have been tested, um, who's getting replacement water, um, you know, just I, there's so much um, really valuable information in this. So really appreciate it. Um, I don't have any questions on it at this point. Thanks. Thank you, board member. And thank you, Ms. Sobeck. I uh, really appreciate it. That concludes item number five and it concludes our uh, board meeting today. Uh, we don't have a board workshop or meeting tomorrow. So this board meeting is now to be adjourned and uh, we, our next board meeting will be on March 1st. So we'll see you, see you soon. Uh, stay safe, be well, and really appreciate everyone's incredible engagement today and work. Um, I know, again, not an easy discussion, but um, really appreciative of everyone's engagement. So thank you all. Thanks for your time and attention. We'll see you very soon. Take care.